Can you see my screen with the PowerPoint? Yes. Thank you. Sorry. Tech whiz here. Hi, my name is Leslie Goodbody, and I am staff to Annalisa Bevan um, on CARB's uh, infrastructure team, um, focusing mostly on heavy duty. So I'm just wanting to launch off this meeting today, um, welcome everybody, and just start with a general background. Um, on August 22nd, staff conducted a kickoff meeting to seek feedback on the information um, of a series of work groups to assist in implementing the ACF regulation. An application to the Joint ACF Truck Regulation Implementation Group, or TRIG, was sent out through a bulletin on September 15th and closed on September 29th. Staff reviewed the survey responses and selected active members with the aim of balancing stakeholder representation for each of the work groups. However, due to an overwhelming interest in the TRIG, not all applicants were selected and applicants were placed into, one, into only one group. Emails were sent out to all applicants on October 20th and um, informing them of their initial selection. And this initial list has been established to balance the groups at under 30 active members. The first quarterly meetings um, are today and Friday, December 8th. We will um, collaborate with our panelists to establish subsequent meeting dates, which we anticipate will happen quarterly. Should my slide is advancing. Why is my slide advancing? Mm -hmm. There we go. <laughs> so first I'm gonna go over the general introduction and the purpose of, of um, the TRIG work groups, of all the TRIG work groups, followed by a brief overview of the rule provisions, member roles and responsibilities, and meeting expectations. Yes, here we go. Um, the Advanced Fleet Clean Fleets Regulation was adopted by the board on April 28, 2023, and approved by the Office of, Minis of Administrative Law and became effective on October 1st, 2023. The purpose of each TRIG work group is to discuss best practices for ACF implementation consistent with the reg language, um, to discuss best practices, um, excuse me, to uh, develop recommendations and action items on selected topics, to, and to facilitate constructive dialogue to address key rule implementation issues. For slide four, I'm gonna pass this discussion on to Annalisa. Hi, um, I'm Annalisa Bevan, CARB's Zero Emission Infrastructure Specialist, and I'm one of the co-chairs for this um, infrastructure, for this TRIG, um, and I keep getting messed that Zoom has crashed. Uh, that's weird. I can um, still hear you. Okay. You're good. I can hear you and see you. Oh, dear. Okay. Nope, not anymore. <laughs> Okay. okay. Um, All right. Um, She's back. If this, if well, there this you are. continues, I'm going to pass it back to um, Leslie. But I'm assuming you can hear me. Yes. Um, I wanted to make clear uh, what the what this trig is and what it is not. Um, the implementation group meetings are really intended to help with implementation and not um, uh, not intended to be a forum to make changes to the regulation. That would happen in a different setting. Um, we do want to identify main concerns for fleet operators and owners um, around infrastructure issues and figure out how we can act together um, to try and solve those. Uh, and so we are looking for this to be a solution oriented conversation. Um, you may have noticed that this meeting in particular doesn't have a set like topic related uh, agenda because we want to hear from you. Um, what uh, what your priorities are, what challenges you're facing, um, and then we can start prioritizing how uh, how we go about um, uh, solving those. To dive into that just a little bit deeper, um, the TRIG is not an advocacy group or an advi advisory group. Um, so in terms of identifying what we can accomplish, um, we can get we can have a conversation. Um, we can educate each other, 
and individual organizations can then take action, but we wouldn't as a body be um, uh, making recommendations or engaging in advocacy. Uh, I could think of a few examples, but I don't want to put any of our sister agencies on the spot, but let's say there was an agency that had a proceeding or a regulation um, in uh, process. Uh, this group um, can certainly talk about that, but we wouldn't be coming up with a recommendation for how that agency proceeds. Um, we don't want them to be part of the conversation, obviously. Uh, and then um, uh, individual members can use that conversation and what they've learned to, um, to interact with that agency. But on a different level, we might have things that come out of this, um, this group that are actions for state agencies like CARB or um, CEC or CPC, Caltrans, um, C, uh, CTC, GoBiz, that are um, things that those agencies can look into uh, implementing uh, or take action on. So we're not we're not closing the door for that kind of conversation for sure. Um, let's see. Um, Leslie, yeah, your I'm next. screen share is now showing. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I we're gonna, we're gonna figure out it. get out of it yep. okay sorry about that so, um, yeah and so certainly uh where where the conversations um from these meetings and from this group uh take us will um help inform carb and our partner state agencies as we implement um the clean uh, sorry advanced clean fleets regulation so I'll turn it back to Leslie. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so this um, infrastructure trig has three co-chairs and we'll introduce those shortly. The co-chairs are responsible for facilitating a roundtable discussion to improve meeting productivity and open dialogue. The purpose of the trig is to have an open forum to engage in constructive dialogue. And active members are panelists from each of the trig groups. Chairs of each trig group can add or remove members as needed and to maintain balance and productivity. Chairs for each group can also decide to meet more frequently or as needed on an as needed basis and also form subgroups to dig into specific topics if warranted. Only active members for each trig topic area are panelists and may have video, chat, and screen share permissions and can mute and unmute themselves. All active members are expected to arrive to the scheduled meeting on time, review meeting summaries, and engage in constructive dialogue. Um, active members are responsible for ensuring that their de desktop client or mobile app can support Zoom and that the program is loaded and working before the scheduled meeting. CARB staff don't have to, do not provide support for Zoom software but will ser serve to host and administer Zoom functions throughout the meetings. This time, we anticipate that meetings will be held quarterly over Zoom, but um, and the times will be available for public comment at the end of each meeting. Oh, and we're allotting time at the end of each meeting for public comment. And then after each meeting, CARB staff is going to reach out to our active members for feedback on the meeting summaries. And all meetings will be recorded and meeting materials will be available online. And um, the public and active members of other TRIG topic areas can attend any of the meetings and then be able to um, provide comment, uh, comment at, during the public comment period. Also, each TRIG work group can decide whether additional mediators, uh, mediators are needed after this meeting. Lastly, the TRIG is not an advisory media committee to the board, and I think Annalisa covered that in pretty good depth there. Um, so we're going to continue to post all the meetings at this website, and this includes summaries, presentations, and video recordings from past meetings and, and agendas and handouts for future meetings. So this concludes the general TRIG presentation, and I'm going to pass the mic on over to Annalisa. And this is um, what we have going on for this particular meeting. Um, this is pretty much the meat and potatoes of it. And I'm gonna pass it on to Annalisa and we'll start the co-chair, uh, the staff and the co-chair and the panelists introduction. Great. Thank you. 
Um, as I mentioned, uh, we didn't want to pre-decide what issues were important to you as panelists and participants. So, um, and we would like to take this meeting to get to know you um, and uh, really turn this into a constructive dialogue, a solutions oriented group um, that can tackle some of these um, tough issues. So um, we're going to spend a chunk of our time Oh dear, Leslie. I know, I'm sorry, it, it's opening up on the wrong screen and I'm so bad. it won't let me move it. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Um, we would like to take uh, um, time to a chunk of uh, this meeting to go around our panel and uh, meet everybody. Uh, if you could share your name and affiliation, um, what your organization does, um, uh, the services provided, who your constituents are, things like that. and. If you could describe for us briefly what you see as the top challenges facing zero emission truck um, deployment from an infrastructure perspective. Um, then we'll take a break uh, where we will uh, prioritize, you know, we'll be taking copious notes on all of this, sort of um, tallying up uh, uh, what we're hearing and turn that into a poll, which um, we'll administer after the break so that we can prioritize what issues are um, uh, hitting for the majority of um, of our members, and um, and that will help us set the first couple of agendas um, for future meetings. Um, and as was mentioned, we'll move to an open comment for our attendees, uh, and then close with next steps. So, um, are we moving Let's... to uh, introductions of our co-chairs? Why don't we start with um, staff, starting with myself. <laughs> yes, go for yeah, it. Leslie Goodbye here, I, I, I um, introduced myself earlier. I'm, I'm staff to Annalisa on helping to um, be the ringleader on this infrastructure trig effort. And um, I will pass the mic on over to Catherine Garrison. Good afternoon, all, and thank you so much for joining this important discussion. I'm here in a supporting role for um, Leslie and Annalisa, and I'd like to introduce Marian, our colleague on our CARB infrastructure team. Marian, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Katrin. Hello, everyone. I'm Miriam uh, Delavarafi, an Air Resources Engineer at CARB. I work for Annalisa and um, with Leslie and Katrin in Zero Emission Vehicle Infrastructure Team. Uh, I turn it back to Leslie. Well, yeah, so how about we'll um, introduce our, um, how about Molly? <laughs> Hi, <laughs> my name is Molly Munns. Um, I worked with the team here at CARB to help develop the Advanced Clean Fleets Regulation, and I'm just here supporting overall for the, the four or four total trigs that we have, um, two today and then two on Fridays. Thank and you. if we have either one of our students in the room, I'd like to introduce them, either Roman or Borden. Hello, uh, my name's Borden Van. I am uh, a student assistant I uh, have the best internet connection. For uh, and everybody, pretty much through uh, researches or uh, whatever that I need. Uh, no. Thanks, Borden. Um, Roman. Hello, my name is Roman Vasiliev, and I'm a student assistant um, for Annalisa as well. And I go to Sac City, and my major is computer science. So our student assistants are helping us with um, tracking and uh, implementing this trig, and we very much appreciate their help. Um, okay, I'm Annalise Bevan. I introduced myself as Zero Emission Infrastructure Specialist. I'm also uh, Mobile Source Control Division Assistant Division Chief, and I've been focused for the last few years um, ex exclusively on zero emission infrastructure and coordinating with our partner state agencies, um, because at the end of the day, um, we can adopt regulations that require the transition to zero emission uh, vehicles and equipment, but if we have no way to fuel them, um, we won't be successful. So um, really trying to do whatever we can to um, assist with accelerating that deployment. Um, are we good with CARB folks? I'd like to turn it over to- Wente. Um, Wente, yeah. 
Hi, I'm Wen Jay. Um, I've been working on the advanced lien trucks and advanced lien fleets regulation for the past few years. And I'm also here to support our trig efforts. Thank you. Thanks, Wen Jay. Okay, yeah. um, I'd like to turn it over to Adam Browning, our one of our co-chairs. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Adam Browning with Forum Mobility. Should I do the, the three minute intro? Yeah, let's go for it. All right. I'll be as uh, succinct and precise as possible. So Forum Mobility, we uh, build third party uh, truck charging depots in and around the ports in California and then uh, along common freight routes out to common destinations in the Inland Empire and Central Valley. Um, we offer uh, either charging uh, as a service, so one monthly fee for charging, or a truck plus charging together, uh, also for one monthly fee. Um, we last week we announced uh, the our latest site inside the Port of Long Beach. We're very excited for it. Um, it will serve a couple hundred trucks a day once it's up and running. Uh, the um, fall of 2024. Uh, my three, and I'm, uh, I am a co-chair, uh, I'm here to help facilitate, um, um, and move things along in a coordinated and succinct fashion. Uh, the, um, top challenges facing zero emission truck deployments, um, the trucks, uh, currently the truck costs are too high. The LCFS credit is too low. Uh, hosting capacity on distribution feeders is too small, too rare, and interconnections take too long. Um, so those are four quick ones right there. I will pass it. Uh, I'm actually not sure who to pass it to. Um, let's go with Mark. Uh, Mark Perry, our other co-chair. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mark Perry with the California Energy Commission. I'm an agreement manager in project manager in the fuels and transportation division uh the cec's clean transportation program allocates about 42 million dollars in funding for the purchase and installation of uh medium and heavy duty zero emission vehicle infrastructure uh, additionally the budget acts of 2021 and 2022 require the cec to fund uh, zero emission vehicle infrastructure for specific categories uh such as 516 million dollars for dredge trucks 60 million for transit buses 410 million for zero emission school bus infrastructure, 663 million for truck, bus, and off road equipment, 130 million for ports, and about $100 million for emerging opportunities. Uh, one of the challenges that the CEC has run into in the transition to zero emission has been the cost of infrastructure, uh, not just the equipment itself, but the construction costs to install the, to install the chargers and hydrogen stations. Uh, so some of the other challenges have been, of course, grid readiness. Uh, the time and costs for permitting and final inspections. Uh, and there's even been a few cases of landlords not granting permission for their leaseholders to build zero emission vehicle infrastructure on the property. Uh, what the CEC would like to get out of these meetings is a frank substantive dialogue that uh, that works towards making this, the transition to zero emission vehicles as easy as possible. Uh, what this means is, you know, we don't want these meetings to simply talk about problems. We've all been in work groups that simply discuss the issues and nothing really gets done, but we want solutions to these problems uh, as well and workable ideas on what it'll take to implement these changes. Uh, for example, after public input, the CEC and CARB have worked together uh, on releasing funding at the same time and even in conjunction as kind of a one-stop shop for vehicles and infrastructure. Uh, there are currently three projects underway where CARB is funding the vehicles and the CEC is funding the infrastructure. Uh, the CEC is extremely supportive of CARB providing this forum to achieve, to achieve seamless integration and I really look forward to hearing everyone's input. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Leslie, are you, you're on mute. I'm unmuting. Why don't we just, I'll just go down the list because in the order that I see people, Colin Weber, County of Ventura. Hello there, do you read me? Yes. Okay, I'm Colin Weber, the Transportation Sustainability Administrator for the County of Ventura General Services Agency, Fleet Services. In this role, I manage long-term programs for the fleet's transition to cleaner vehicles and compliance with regulations such as those overseen by CARB. Um, fleet Services provides central ownership and administrative control for the County of Ventura fleet 
of over 1,500 vehicles and equipment, of which around 300 fall under the Advanced Clean Fleets regulation. This includes, includes around 60 vans and buses, 200 medium and heavy duty trucks, and 40 specialty heavy duty vehicles. Fleet aids 26 county agencies with all aspects of fleet services, including vehicle, fuel, and telematics management. With this, we serve the county and the public at large. Fleet maintains facilities across Ventura County, including six traditional fueling sites and 10 motor pool locations. Over the past few years, we've installed 49 level two EV chargers for overnight charging with an additional 41 in process under the SCE Charge Ready program. When completed, the stations will be able to support fueling for 120 electric and plug-in hybrid electric hybrid, plug in hydrogen, electric uh, light duty vehicles. We also operate six repair and maintenance shops with a total of 30 technicians, aided by an additional 24 support and administrative staff members. In addition, we manage three light duty shops, one heavy equipment shop, one paint and body shop, and one communications outfit shop. Um, I would echo the uh, co-chairs notes on general funding and costs being a challenge. And as a county, we want to make sure that we take a long-term look. And um, with that, one of the large concerns that we're seeing is for future operational emergency capability of our public works agency, which is heavily affected by advanced cleaning feats. Their roads and watershed departments perform crucial maintenance during peak rain, flood, and landslide events. Heavy duty vehicles and equipment represent a significant portion of the vehicles needed to respond to these 24 to 96 hour emergencies. During this, public works protects our roads, keeping them open for travel or evacuation while mitigating additional damage to infrastructure. The areas of work can be far from garaging locations or even general public charging infrastructure. Um, with this, the current limited capabilities of ZEVs for this type of work, the excessive ex electrical requirements for charging during emergency events because of the heavy usage, and the uh, ever-present potential for power safety shutoffs all point towards potential operational issues during future emergencies without additional assistance in action. That's Thank what I have. You. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, next on my list, I have uh, Ryan Bankard from UPS. Thanks, Leslie. And thanks, Annalisa, for putting this together. Ryan Bankard with UPS. I'm the Director of Automotive Sustainability from the Corporate Office in Atlanta. UPS is a last mile parcel delivery company and that we uh, operate over 100,000 vehicles worldwide. We have 18,000 vehicles that are alternative or advanced technology vehicles with majority of those being based in California through partnerships with CARB um, and aligning with a lot of CARB's uh, uh, regul regulatory practices. So the zero tailpipe emission vehicles, we, we definitely see a use and are excited to get those deployed in our last mile delivery fleet. Um, there are a lot of challenges, just a fun fact about UPS. Our first electric vehicle was deployed in Los Angeles, our first 10 in 1936. Um, so since 1936, the challenges have abound, or abound in deploying EVs and it definitely is only getting um, more challenging with scale, which is what I think we're all facing here today. So just quickly, the three or some top challenges that I see is cost, 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 cost. Um, there's cost on infrastructure, cost on vehicle side, and it doesn't appear to be alleviating. Permitting has uh, surprisingly presented a number of challenges um, that we did not expect. And then when you start getting into scale, um, those costs begin to scale, and then the power to operate um, makes everybody uncomfortable. It makes the uh, utilities uncomfortable to provide the power. It makes the communities uncomfortable to have the power in there. 
and um, it, it's really at scale, it gets, gets challenging. However, um, as a fleet that's adopted a lot of low carbon solutions, you know, we feel that electric does play a part. And one interesting thing is, is you can find, you know, these various beachheads where not necessarily at scale, but you might hang 10 chargers on a wall, like some of the folks have talked about here. And you can really kind of get some success in doing that. It's really when you start trying to electrify one building 100% um, that you encounter excessive amounts of delays. And it's almost like uh, it would be better to do it in phases than actually tackle it all at once. But I don't know how you solve for that. Um, so with that, I think that's kind of sums up my presentation. So Leslie, I'll pass it back to you for the next person. All righty. Thank you, Ryan. Um, I see Kyle buying on my list. <clears throat> Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Buying. I am the co-founder and principal at Cornish Technology. We're actually based in New York, um, where I hold a professional engineering license. So we're seeing a uh, kind of a different side to what uh, I've been hearing so far where I'm helping to deploy electric school bus throughout the state. I believe that New York has one of the most aggressive EV adoption laws for electric school bus on the planet, where by 2027, you can only buy zero emission school buses. New York currently operates around the state around 55,000 of these vehicles. So we have roughly three years to be able to scale where you could only buy these vehicles. So we're helping schools, municipalities, dealership networks, a litany of state agencies try and scale to meet this uh, mandate that was put in place by the New York State governor about a year and a half ago. So in doing this, because we, we've we worked with probably 100, 200 schools already, there's 600 individual school districts in New York, um, primarily in upstate outside of the city area, and each one is its own kingdom. So some of the issues that we see are scalability where every single one of these individual entities has to recreate and solve this problem for themselves. There is, on the other side, tons of money available, where there's EPA money available, there's money from NYSERDA here, state agency, for chargers, where they will give you up to $55,000 per plug uh, to help solve this problem. So we have the money portion solved, but as uh, it was said earlier, the workforce development has not been solved yet, where there are not enough electricians in the state to build everything um, on, on uh, prevailing wage rates in order to make this happen in the next couple of years. So that's something where we're really uh, trying to solve. And the other thing is um, right-sizing infrastructure. So there's kind of this push now where um, we're looking at the duty cycle of what vehicles actually try to accomplish, what their route mission is for the day. And we're finding that some folks aren't exactly truthful in what their vehicles do, which leads our recommendation to be maybe a lower power charger. Then when they get the vehicle, they're trying to increase that duty cycle and the charger and battery size just don't accommodate what they're trying to do. So education in the market as to these, like be very truthful into what the duty cycle of your vehicles that you're trying to accommodate is, and meeting that with a product solution is actually one of our uh, hardest things that we're trying to do in the market as well. Thank you so much, Colin. Um, oh, Kyle, <laughs> sorry. I think the next person on my list is, cannot see their name here. Um, how about we'll go with Mal Gowron at ChargePoint. Hey, thanks. Uh, this is Mouse Goron from ChargePoint. Uh, ChargePoint is a leading manufacturer of EV charging equipment. So we provide integrated software, hardware, and installation services serving all use cases. And our goal is to facilitate the growth of EVs through the development of charging infrastructure uh, for all use cases, including residential, commercial public, and commercial fleets for vehicles of all sizes. And so day in and day out, we're working with uh, fleet customers to try and provide solutions for their infrastructure needs. 
Um, and in my role, I'm responsible for ChargePoint's regulatory policy engagement across the West, including California. Um, the two issues that we really see are both related to grid capacity. Um, so the first, and I think someone mentioned it earlier, is about timely energization. Uh, when you're looking at the vehicle procurement timeline for an EV, that can be six to nine months um, for vehicles that are already commercially available. Um, but the energization process can take much longer than that. And so a key issue is the mismatch between how long it takes to acquire a vehicle versus how long it takes to uh, energize a site to be able to charge that vehicle, uh, particularly for our customers that um, are installing charging services uh, on their own properties to charge their, uh, their private fleet vehicles. Um, Contributing to that is the fact that a uh, charging site um, uh, for the customer can be prepared in a matter of weeks or months, whereas the upstream uh, infrastructure can be much longer than that, especially when you get to significantly larger power deployments. And so a challenge is trying to make um, those two timelines align to be able to provide power at a site uh, for when the customer needs it because their, their vehicles are on site and ready to go and, and need to recharge. Um, the second issue related to this uh, comes back to cost and a lack of upstream capacity that can make projects uh, difficult financially to proceed with. Um, and so because of high costs, we see customers uh, maybe incentivized to limit their upfront investments um, that are going to be required to support their long-term electrification efforts through undersizing. Um, which is a shame because undersizing then increases the total long-term costs uh, of electrification on the infrastructure side. And so there's this issue of right-sizing infrastructure and also being prepared um, to meet customer needs as they continue to um, integrate EVs and replace uh, uh, their existing vehicles with EVs. Um, so those are the two key ones. Um, and thanks for meeting you all and uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, oh, thank you so much. Those are good points. Um, I Reed Carter, the next one I had. Hi, my name is Reed Carter. I'm the Director of Environmental Compliance at Granite Rock. Um, <clears throat> we're a mining construction materials and construction company. So we mine granite uh, and then sand and gravel. Um, we make concrete and asphalt and recycled products. And then we have a construction division that uh, lays that down on roads, bridges, foundations, all that stuff. Um, so we have a fleet of, um, my role is specifically is in charge of um, figuring out along with the fleet manager, um, how we are going to make the transition um, to zero emissions technology. We have a fleet of about 400 vehicles. It roughly breaks down into 200 construction service body type vehicles. Um, 100 heavy duty. So that's a combination of mixers, uh, haul trucks, um, on-road haul trucks, um, like of various kinds. And then we have a hundred, what I'd call like miscellaneous um, passenger specialty vehicles, crane trucks, that kind of thing, support. Um, and I think oh, we operate out of the Bay Area, sorry. Um, Central California in the Bay Area is kind of our big um, service location. So I think our big challenge really is the capability of current capability of zero emissions vehicles. Um, we're pretty um, pretty excited about the I, what I'd call maybe the promise of hydrogen. Um, but right now, the way that technology looks is it's, you know, we're looking at being pretty constrained by payload um, and then also the duty cycle. So, you know, our vehicles need to go typically like a couple hundred miles a day at least. Um, and then not on some of our vehicles have a pretty consistent service area, um, but oftentimes we don't. And they also, those vehicles are the ones that tend to operate at kind of their max payload um, and capability. And then the other one, I mean, of course, there's cost as well. Um, but the way I kind of see that is it's really just, the way I like to talk about it anyway, um, is that this is just a real rethinking of the way that we do our work. So, you know, if you, to bring it down to like a very basic 
level, everything that we are able to do, like our service area, where people live, where they work, so on and so forth, is all kind of based on the capability of an internal combustion engine, right? If you have a fuel station on the way, you can go fill up, all that stuff. We have to rethink the entirety of that. So when we think about electric vehicles, it's really, there's a hole there that is larger than the vehicle itself, and it's larger than the charging itself. It's all of the above. Um, so I'm glad to hear a lot of people talk about grid capacity and all that good stuff. Um, and that's kind of what I've been preaching over here is just we, you know, we need to make decisions and the way we do a lot of the way we do business is going to change here. I think that's true for everybody, probably. Um, but we'd be it'll behoove us to think about it from a sort of white sheet approach, if you will. Oh, thank you so much, Reed. And I've been involved in, just to chime in here, I've been involved in some um, panels or maybe ongoing discussions with Department of Energy and the different research that they're doing specifically on mining, construction, mm -hmm. mining and construction equipment in, in the hydrogen fuel cell space because of that duty cycle and exactly what you're talking about there. So there, there is a lot of recognition that um, there's a need to to you know maybe really look into fuel cells especially for those big big mm -hmm. heavy rock trucks and heavy heavy duty cycles where where batteries just and charging just might not make sense so yeah for... offline if you're interested in getting involved in that i think they might want your input so that's why i bring it up <laughs> now yeah that would be great i appreciate it as much as for every challenge that you know the business world is going to face it's a pretty exciting time to be on the forefront of trying to figure it out so all right i got your email I'll link you up. Thank you. You're welcome. Sounds great. All right. Um, okay. So next we're going to have on there, I think we have Raul, Raul Fletes from Los Angeles, Department of Water Power. Oh, well, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, Raul Fletes here from Los Angeles Department of Water and Power, Fleet and Aviation Division. Um, LADWP is a utility provider of both water and power for about 4 million residents, city of Los Angeles. Um, our service territory for electric, on the electric front, it goes up to the Oregon border, um, goes up to uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, um, as well as extending out into Wyoming at the moment. Um, we have approximately 10,000 plus fleet of vehicles, 7,000 all over the road. 3,000 of those are uh, 3,000 are heavy duty off-road construction pieces of equipment. Um, we, we have just about one of everything. Along with that, on any given day, we have about a thousand units of, of vehicles on rent from various manufacturers, stakeholders here in the area from every major rental company around. So when we think of uh, the electrification of equipment and moving into a zero emission, we kind of think of the whole eco structure, uh, ecosystem because it affects so many of the different different companies, stakeholders that we work with in order to do and bring reliable water and power here to the city of LA. And then being tied into the grid of what we do, uh, we're part of a larger community in the Western region of all these states. So our fleet is, um, our, I would say, extreme heavy duty, uh, duty cycles that we operate. Um, a lot of uh, restoration of services and continues, uh, you know, available for everything as well as a lot of heavy duty trucking and construction and moving all our infrastructure uh, items that's all over the state and moves around. So one of the things that we look here at Fleet, we have a section and, and people who are responsible for the infrastructure and the rollout, which a lot of you are talking about for electrification of the fleets across the U.S. and you know across California and, and our area. Um, our focus isn't so much on that because they, they do that portion. We inform them based on what's happening internally to us. Um, we're a much bigger organization as compared, uh, compared to the, um, we're a part of the city of Los Angeles, which is a much bigger organization altogether. They're, we're just one small department within a larger city. Um, so comprised together, we got hundreds of thousands of vehicles that are moving around for the services of LA. Um, so the, the things in my role is specific, I'm the senior manager in charge of buying and procuring equipment for the department um, and kindly always bringing new people and um, new companies into the fold. But I would say that our, our biggest challenges we see is which much of which everybody here states is uh, infrastructure, right? Bringing that infrastructure 
at the scale that you need in order to do that electrification front is really the challenge that, that we see. Um, as well as I mentioned the duty cycle, that's something that's important to what we do. We, we have a, an enormous fleet so we can pick and choose where we put that equipment. Now we have about 235 electric vehicles from medium all the way to class eight heavy duty electric vehicles operating today. Um, but to bring that up to scale, to really transfer and change that, it's difficult. And then we have certain areas that we operate um, because of our transmission system where we will never have that, right? But they, they, they're they from Los Angeles. It's just they're operating across all these different avenues and locations. Um, we are, I'm highly hopeful that, you know, hydrogen fuel, which is something we're looking at, will be something, but it, we still don't have the infrastructure for that as well. I mean, it, it falls back on the infrastructure. Um, and to the point of a lot of people here, you know, cost is um, is enormous. Which you, when you start thinking of when you're replacing an entire fleet with an electric vehicle fleet, the cost gets very high. And then the duty cycle and replacement of those things have to be replaced much sooner than, than normal. We tend to keep our fleet a little bit longer. We operate 27 repair facilities, over 200 mechanics across uh, multiple different states um, to maintain this fleet. And when you go to a full EV system, a full EV vehicle, um, we're looking to replace those much sooner because of the, the duty cycle and batteries and things that happen, which is challenging, right? And then we look at duty cycle or charging not as a level two, but level three and possibly something higher because the crews and the way that the equipment operates, it operates 18, 20 hours, you know, at times. So we need something that can charge them quickly. Um, that amount of uh, capacity isn't there yet. So we have to look at a lot of alternate solutions, which is um, challenging. And again, more money. Um, so that's uh, in a nutshell what we do here at Ali Water Power. Thank you, Raul. And um, I'm hoping maybe during this conversation, if you can, you can, um, you know, later after we've introduced everybody, speak to your own, you know, because LADWP also is a utility territory, right? <laughs> Are you not? Are you not part of that? Yeah. So, they're also the ones granting permits and energizing the charging infrastructure as well. For um, uh, correct, we will. I do need, uh, I'll just have to say that you know from the onset that my role, and that's kind of why I made the distinction. My role, what I do versus what they do on the on the planning new business and that part of it. Um, because our company, the way it's broken up, I can't speak to what they okay. do on their side because of matters with new rules, planning in the state and different regulations. Um, they speak for themselves. I can't. I can speak to from a fleet perspective and what we do here out of water power. I can't speak to that portion of it. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry to put you on the spot there. Um, all right, so the next person uh, we have, Kyle, have you already? Yes, you've talked. Uh, Frank Harris, um, if you could introduce yourself, that'd be great. Uh, great. Thank you very much. My name is Frank Harris. I manage energy regulatory policy for the California Municipal Utilities Association. I'll apologize in advance uh, if my voice is cracking in spite of, take, of getting my flu vaccine. I am sitting with 102 degree fever and the flu. But hopefully it's much less severe given that I got the flu shot. Um, CMUA is uniquely positioned because uh, we represent uh, public agencies throughout the state providing electricity and water service. And as such, our members are both regulated under the advanced clean fleets as owners and operators of medium and heavy duty vehicles, as well as on the electric side, um, agencies that uh, establish um, power distribution, in some cases, uh, power transmission systems, and provide electric service needed to uh, serve the needs of our growing electric fleets. We have uh, 77 total public agency members. 61 of them are water members. 46 are electric. That doesn't add to 77 because many of them, like LEDWP, provide both electric and water. I think uh, given what was just discussed, I wanted to raise one quick point 
and that is um, the the structure of our membership varies. We have members such as Los Angeles Department of Water and Power that are departments of a city government. We also have members such as Sacramento Municipal Utility District that are special districts. It's important to understand that even with our city departments like LADWP, uh, LADWP has to go to their planning department, not the city's planning department, not LADWP's planning department, the city to get building permits. LADWP does not have the authority to provide their own building permits. And so I think that's uh, a really important point to uh, keep in mind that even for the city departments, they don't necessarily have the ability to grant their own permits. Um, and so they face uh, sometimes very similar uh, uh, backlogs of uh, permit authority. Um, our main concerns, as I was uh, advocating on behalf of my membership throughout the regulatory process, our main concerns were uh, continuing our ability to provide uh, electric and water service particularly during emergency response circumstances where the vehicles may well be uh, out of the field, far away from any type of charging infrastructure for an unpredictable period of time. And so that's kind of the nature of the conversations we had with regard to that. Um, I think that I'm trying to look at my notes. I think Kyle mentioned uh, hydrogen, I apologize, Kyle, if I'm misstating that. Uh, we have a number of members that are very bullish on hydrogen. We actually do think that hydrogen can uh, provide um, a uh, part of the solution uh, because it can be, hydrogen can be refueled uh, much more quickly generally than electricity. So if you are on an extended emergency response deployment, that may well be a great uh, a beneficial or a preferred option. So we uh, continue to evaluate that. Um, Kyle, you also mentioned workforce. Uh, we're having workforce issues here in California on all sides of my association, both on the water and the electric side. CMUA has stood up a workforce. Uh, I, I will misstate this and I'll apologize later, but I, I don't know if it's a task force. But um, uh, we have uh, uh, begun to investigate and evaluate solutions to this workforce problem. These solutions, I mean, this problem goes beyond electricity, but this is the part of the shop that I work in. And so I'm more familiar with them. And that is in terms of just, uh, electricians, linemen. Um, and, uh, and so this is something that I think is not just not unique to California. I'm, I'm hearing about it all over the country. And so the workforce issue that Kyle raised is, is certainly an ongoing challenge. But we really look forward to continuing this dialogue. We think that uh, the uh, elements of infrastructure run across various state policy goals. Uh, we look at electrification and the building, uh, uh, the building sector. We're going to need to be able to make sure and support those goals, support that load, as well as, of course, continuing growth in uh, in um, electric vehicles. And and so one of the things that we uh, consistently push for is affordability and reliability, because those two conditions have to be met in order to continue to maintain the interest of the general public of going out and buying. Uh, more Nissan Leafs and, and the like. Great. Thank you. Questions. Thank you very much. Yeah, great. Um, so I'm going to ask others as we move forward, try to keep your comments down to three minutes. And especially if you've heard somebody mention, um, you know, there's certain key themes that are coming out loud and clear. You can just say echo. We did O. And then, um, you know, that you agree with that. I, I think we're we're keeping a pretty good list going. So we're definitely capturing what people have already said. So, um Maybe you could just make sure we focus on something on 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 anything new and or elaborating on 
um, and giving more detail on some of the things that have already been mentioned. So the next person on my list is um, Joe Galgiano, and name your affiliation as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Joe Galliano with uh, Air Products. I'm a policy manager in the Hydrogen for Mobility Group. Uh, Air Products is a, a global hydrogen producer and also a uh, developer, owner, and operator of light, medium, and heavy-duty hydrogen refueling stations across the globe. Um, I would, I'll be very brief here. Our top top two challenges, as we see, is one. Uh, building out in California a, uh, a reliable hydrogen refueling station uh, network uh, at scale to handle the uh, medium heavy duty truck uh, market segments. And also um, corresponding to that, developing and deploying a zero and low carbon uh, hydrogen production supply uh, to meet those demands of the transportation sector as well. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you. Um, the next we have on our list is uh, Chris Shimoda. Thanks, Leslie. Good afternoon. Uh, Chris Shimoda, I'm Senior Vice President of Government Affairs for the California Trucking Association. Uh, CTA is the statewide trade association for the trucking industry. Um, we've got about a thousand members. Um, they run the gamut from Fortune 500 companies to very small uh, mom and pop trucking companies located in the state of California. Um, our average member is a 20 truck, typically multi-generation <clears throat> family owned and operated fleet. Uh, everything from uh, parcel, agriculture, construction, uh, general freight, ports, you name it, uh, they're in our association. And getting to go this late in the presentation, I'm glad to say all, all of the good stuff was taken on challenges. So I'll just uh, reiterate uh, my agreement with most of what was stated. Um, I think the only thing that I did not hear was uh, pace and timeline. So ditto to all the challenges and everything needs to be figured out very quickly. Um, according to you know some of our back of the envelope, uh, estimates in order to get to the 2035 vehicle deployments under ACT and ACF, uh, we need to get about three to 500 DC fast chargers in the ground every week between now and 2035. And that's including all the associated upstream uh, transmission and distribution infrastructure. So uh, agree with everybody and also just want to say we we have to figure this out very quickly if there's going to be success. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, let's see. Dave Mycia. Oh, did you talk already, Dave? No, I have not. Okay, it's your turn. My name is Dave Meisel. I'm the Vice President of Fleet for Quanta Services. Uh, Quanta is a utility infrastructure company. Uh, we have a fleet of about 80,000 pieces of equipment. And any given day, we rent another 10,000 to 15,000 uh, just to uh, do normal business. Uh, currently, we have about 60,000 employees all across the U.S. and Canada. I'll, I'll limit my comments to North America. We're in other countries and continents as well. But um, and we are currently the largest employer of both union and non-union line workers in North America. Quanta is the largest provider of utility infrastructure solutions in North America. We provide utility-grade construction services in the areas of renewables, telecom, electric, and pipeline. In addition, we have a manufacturing division that specializes in utility-level transformers and mobile battery solutions. Uh, currently, the battery solutions are up to 1.2 megawatts. We have a 2.4 or 2.5 megawatt mobile solution coming out in 2024. Uh, our primary clients are all the utilities in North America. We operate in all 50 states and all the provinces of Canada. And uh, we are basically the 911 call for all of the utilities in North America. When something really bad happens, whether it's the wildfires in California or the uh, hurricanes in Florida, we are the primary responder to all of those. Quanta is a complete uh, infrastructure, con has complete infrastructure construction capabilities, starting with grid analysis and project management on the one end, 
and working our way through engineering, design, procurement, and construction. Um, so we we stay fairly busy most of the time. And I will say uh, ditto on, on all of the challenges, but the one thing that I would offer that may be different is no one is really talking about the impact of these new vehicles on driver's licenses. You know, most of these new battery vehicles are taking vehicles that have historically been non-CDL drivers and making them CDL drivers. Same thing with the hydrogen. When you get enough tank structure on there to carry enough hydrogen to uh, actually get, get it through your day, the weight of those vehicles is escalating so high that, um, that we now have a, another constraint, which is called drivers. And that is something that nobody is talking about. The other thing I would offer from a safety perspective, I have done this a long time, about 45 years I've been in this business, uh, including um, a significant stint at Pacific Gas and Electric running the fleet there for uh, more than a decade. And the the size of the vehicles with the tank structure, um, I will tell you, is a special challenge for people who don't drive trucks for a living. All of these people are linemen. They are electricians. They are pipe fitters. Uh, they're not drivers, and their skill set is different. Um, and that's just something I think we need to start paying a little more attention to because it's real and it'll be here on day number one. Thank you. Thank you for your insights. Appreciate it. Um, Alessandra, you can pronounce your name. <laughs> Thanks, Leslie. Alessandra Magnosco, I am the Government Affairs and Regulatory Director for the California Fuels and Convenience Alliance. CFCA represents fuel marketers, gas station owners, and common carriers across the state. Our members are predominantly small and minority wholesalers and retailers of traditional fuels and motor oils, as well as alternative fuels, including hydrogen, electric charging stations, compressed natural gas, renewable and biodiesel, and E85. Uh, we serve all California residents, agriculture, police, and fire departments, cities, the construction industry, and all consumer goods moved by the delivery and transportation industries. The primary concerns for the industry are vehicle availability, capability, and cost, and the lack of infrastructure to meet the energy needs of the sector. The vehicles currently offered by manufacturers do not have sufficient range to serve the needs of the fuels transportation industry. Our industry vehicles are often used nearly continuously to ensure fuels are delivered on time to serve other businesses and consumers. A disruption in the efficiency of this supply chain can mean shortages, longer wait times for consumers, and impacts on prices. And the much higher cost to purchase these ZEVs as compared to their internal combustion engine counterparts means higher costs will inevitably be passed on to the consumer, including gas prices. As a result of the extended downtime to charge these vehicles that are typically not used in an out and back manner, there are also substantial concerns around intensifying the ubiquitous parking shortages that already exist for the heavy duty sector. CFCA appreciates that the rule includes considerations for extensions due to infrastructure challenges. However, the extensions necessitate detailed applications from our small business owners, which is concerning. Local permitting also plays a huge role in the lack of charging infrastructure that we have across the state. Uh, typically, when our members present these electrical infrastructure projects, local planners too often add hundreds of thousands of dollars in site upgrades. Without a comprehensive review of all local ordinances and requirements, it is impossible to determine what the fully realized cost of electrification will be. Energization upgrade wait times for private fleets to charge their vehicles on site are also usually multi-year projects. I look forward to collaborating with this work group to find solutions to mitigate these issues. Uh, thank you, Alessandra. Um, have we heard from Eric Carlin of pg and &E yet? Yeah, thanks, Leslie, um, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Eric Carlin with uh, pg and &E's Clean Transportation Team, focusing on policy and board strategy. I'm relatively new to the utility, joining from the EV charging industry in, in May, but I've been in this space since 2017 and glad to be part of this, this effort. Um, so by way of a little bit of background, pg and &E, we're the single largest utility in the country by most metrics, serve about two-thirds of the state. Um, we operate a significant fleet ourselves, and about one in six EVs in the entire country are in our service area. That's, that's over half a million, and we have a goal to uh, get to at least three million by 2030. Um, and we've arrived at this point by a combination of deliberate state policy and investments and over a decade of concerted utility programs and investments to move the market and address barriers with a, with a growing focus on fleet and medium and heavy duty. Um, 
but with our success in spurring and supporting adoption, we're, we're now engaging in addressing new challenges, including those related to, to grid capacity. Um, we are working to meet growing customer and energy related demand while continuing to invest in our, our system to mitigate wildfire risk and complete critical safety related work. Um, while we've invested nearly uh, 1 billion in capacity upgrades over the last eight years and are spending more on capacity than ever before, uh, we know that this investment has not been sufficient to meet some current and future customer needs and that some customers are indeed experiencing uncertainty in longer than expected energization timelines. Um, indeed, our efforts and investments are ramping up enormously and we have a plan to invest uh, around 15 billion in capacity and asset health over the next decade, including leveraging non-traditional funding sources. Uh, as, as part of these efforts in the, sh in the shorter term, we're, we're working closely with customers to deliver technology-based solutions that can help to address their near-term electric electricity needs and have also recently reorganized our operations into a regional service model that enables us to better address local needs and provide a direct path uh, to more uh, quickly and efficiently escalate emerging uh, issues. We also recently filed a proposal for a transportation and electrification advisory services program, which would provide grant writing, electrification planning, um, energization and post energization support to medium and heavy duty operating entities, including schools, transit agencies, and small businesses that are located in disadvantaged communities. Um, with a longer time horizon, we're, we're also creating and adopting new integrated grid planning approaches to meet the needs of our customers and communities and to support the state's bold climate goals and uh, are developing uh, stable multi-year plans to give our teams and communities more visibility into the work we will do and when we'll do it and to help customers understand when they can get new connections and upgrades in the area. Um, we are also advocating for higher T load forecasts used for grid planning that are better aligned with state ZEV goals to enable faster grid build out and are improving our forecasting capabilities to better inform when and where growth is most likely to materialize. Um, and we're also working with customers and communities to understand future electricity needs to inform proactive capacity upgrade projects. So um, I'll just you know, conclude by saying that preparing the grid is indeed a, you know, a, a, a significant endeavor um, and, and supporting growing EV load requires significant collaboration and alignment between state agencies, utilities, customers, and stakeholders. So yeah, we're glad to be part of this dialogue and look forward to the conversation. Thanks. Thank you so much, Eric. Um, next is Sam Wilson. Hey there, can you hear me okay? Yep. Great, thanks so much. Uh, yeah, thanks to CARB staff for having us here today. Uh, my name is Sam Wilson. I'm a senior vehicles analyst with the Union of Concerned Scientists based in Oakland. I lead our Western States heavy duty vehicle electrification policy and technical uh, analysis. So um, UCS is a national nonprofit uh, we're backed by around half a million supporters, and at the highest level, um, we work to ensure that our democracy is guided by rigorous science. Uh, one of the several areas of focus for ECS is clean transportation, specifically for a healthier climate and more equitable access to clean air. Um, so uh, just thinking about California, um, specifically, uh, um, electrifying commercial vehicles is, is really key to mitigating climate change and especially improving public health. Um, uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles are around 7% of the vehicles on California's roads and highways, but they're responsible for uh, around a third of greenhouse gas emissions, two thirds of uh, ozone forming nitrogen oxides, and over half of lung, lung damaging particulate matter. Um, from vehicles on California's roads. Um, so in terms of, uh, of the, uh, you know, the, the issues that I'm seeing, I mean, there's, the, you know, a lot, there's been a lot of good um, examples today, but um, kind of putting those together, I'm, I'm still seeing the work towards cleaner commercial vehicles um, and supporting the related infrastructure is still too fragmented. Um, I think that this will lead to delayed construction and interconnections and reductions in economic efficiencies. So kind of exasper exasperating some of the time, cost, and workforce concerns that other folks have mentioned so far. I think that this could be better addressed through stronger coordination among state and local agencies and utilities, uh, and doing that in close consultation with fleets and experts and communities as well. Um, so that's to say just to you know approach the 
transition to clean freight, freight and infrastructure from a kind of a whole of government plus strategy. So leveraging cross agency resources, legal authorities, expertise, um, and creating additional opportunities for station standardizations, economic, uh, you know, economies of scale, um, speeding development, and reducing negative impacts, uh, especially to sensitive habitats or um, to disproportionately impacted communities, or avoiding, you know, um, uh, examples of compromised air quality benefits from poor planning, like, uh, you know, the use of peaker generators at charging stations and stuff like that. So, yeah, I think that this work group is going to be a, a huge step in the right direction, and I'm certainly glad to be a part of it. And it's nice to see some new faces and meet everyone that uh, haven't met yet. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, let's see the next one. Have we heard yet from David Rothbart, Clean Water SoCal? I think we did, right? No, not yet. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm so never good sure. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. David Rothbart. I'm representing uh, Clean Water SoCal. We represent the wastewater sector for Southern California. And based on my background, you can see I work for the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. So essentially, you know, we're we're tasked with treating society's waste. You flush your, your toilet, it goes to our treatment facilities. We need to take care of that. And as part of that process, we use trucks and vehicles. And uh, my employer is an early adopter of uh, electrifying vehicles. And just as far as challenges, one experience we've had and wanted to share with everyone is a challenge. And the parallel would be, you remember when you got your cell phones, your brand new cell phones, and you know, you go and you look today and you look in your drawer, you see all these different chargers that go for those cell phones because there wasn't a standardized connector. Even today, you go between Apple and Android, there's a different connector. Well, we're experiencing that on the charging infrastructure side. For example, we installed a lot of charging for heavy duty vehicles, or at least tried to, and found the conduits we put in are insufficient for the chargers being sold today, rather to, than what we're planning to put in two years ago. So it's really... You know, one thing when you get your cell phone charger and it costs five bucks versus spending millions of dollars putting in the infrastructure. So one challenge we all have to tackle is standardization. You can't you don't want people putting in infrastructure that's immediately outdated because there's no standard. That's something that really has to be addressed right away. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is the unique situation for the waste sector is we generate a renewable non-fossil fuel biogas and people flush the toilets, it's always going to be generated. And as far as the infrastructure goes, if CARB and society says that biogas should go to hydrogen, we need that certainty. We need to understand that's something where that gas needs to go into that sector and have the infrastructure be supported. Right now, there isn't that clarity of what to do with this biogas. So that would be another element unique for our sector. And it would be very helpful overall for the state to have a vision what to do with this gas to get to uh, zero emissions and uh, move forward. So that's all I have. Thank you very much for letting me join your group. Audrey Newman, sorry. Hi, uh, this is Audrey Newman. I'm from the California Public Utilities Commission, or CPUC. Um, I think most of you are probably familiar with the CPUC, but uh, for those who are not, the CPUC regulates the state's investor-owned utilities who are responsible for serving approximately 80% of California's electric customers through their grid infrastructure. Uh, as regulators of the IOUs, the CPC is critical to building, funding, and planning for the needed electric infrastructure to serve new EV load. Um, you know, I think we've heard a lot of different challenges that um, folks have brought up on this call. And, you know, while there's a lot of challenges we could discuss, um, I want to just highlight a couple today. First being um, understanding where, when, and how vehicle electric load will appear. Uh, this information is really key to helping utilities uh, build needed distribution and transmission infrastructure in advance of when customers are going to need it uh, and helpful for us in planning with the utilities on how to do so um, along with our partners at the CEC. 
Um, this also hopefully will reduce customer wait times down the road. The second one I wanted to highlight really quickly was just balancing costs to ratepayers with accelerated electric infrastructure build out. So we know there are current challenges to timely energization, some of which you know, falls within the utility's responsibilities. Um, but building the infrastructure we need at the scale and time uh, needed will take significant ratepayer funds, and that does impact the electric rates we all pay. So you know, this is a balancing act we do have to address, and I think is a very key challenge to, um, to everything that we're doing on zero emission vehicles in particular on uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles. And back to you, Leslie. Thank you so much, Audrey. Um, <clears throat> next, we have Lisa McGee. Hi there, I'm Lisa McGee and I'm with Tom's Truck Center. I'm the Zero Emission Programs and Affairs Manager and this is actually a newly invented position for the dealership. And it's meant to support the sales and the customers as well as the organization as it relates to the zero emission vehicle technology. Tom's Truck Center is a medium heavy duty commercial truck dealership that has been in operation since 1949. We have been involved in six different awarded utility make ready and state equipment grants for fleet infrastructure. And I have been personally active in the CPUC rate case proceedings and rulemaking related to medium heavy duty charging and innovative rate design since 2016. We offer new truck sales and leasing as well as used sales, maintenance services and parts and inventory with delivery, dismantling. We have a customer support center as well as an expert solution center. We'll be opening up EV rentals and charging center in quarter one of 2024. We have 30 master certified technicians we have 20 medium heavy duty bays. We have six HVIP dealers and 20 South Coast AQMD dealers. We're also a low carbon fuel standard LRT authorized agent. We'll be opening up 16 high voltage DC fast chargers plus 1200 kilowatt hours of battery storage at the dealership in quarter one, 2024. We primarily service small slides, businesses and fleets. Uh, our distribution is with Isuzu, Hino Ford, Green Power, Nikola, and in 2024, Re. Our utility is Southern California Edison. However, all investor-owned utilities and public utilities, including renewable in Southern California, support our customers. The fleet types include Class 1 to Class 8 commercial trucks that are ICE, EV, and hydrogen. Our community base is primarily either public, private, nonprofit, large, and small with a large customer base that is primarily the small business entities. The top challenges that we see are is that there's no public charging access for medium heavy duty fleets, including hydrogen at any level that supports other required deployments today. So there's a lack of rate design to specifically support small fleets that will have the same high power voltage needs as large fleets, but these small fleets will specifically have low utilization. With low utilization, they'll end up with high operational EV fuel costs due to the small fleet that will have high demand fees with low utilization. Um, thirdly, there's a lack of subsidies for non-grid supported charging solutions, which can be quick drop-in temporary solutions that can be very useful to getting started while waiting for permanent solutions. Lastly, uh, the utilities, which you've heard today already, but I wanna kind of expand on that as it relates to transparency and timeliness. There could be an opportunity for switch gear that we all know has got a long lead time, um, but the utilities just aren't taking a proactive approach to these lead times that um, are challenges that could help solve keeping these uh, programs moving along. Thank you very much for being a part of the group. Thank you for your input, Lisa. Um, let's see, uh, we have not heard yet from, have we heard from Bascom Gracian? Have I totally muted that, mutilated that name? Well, maybe while Bascom is um, trying to find his mic, how about Aravind, Kelly S? No, I'm here. Okay, go Aravind. 
Well, uh, Bascom, I'm here. I'm trying to get the video started. There you go. Can you see me? Yes, we can see you. We can hear you. Yes. So Bascom Grishin is my name. I'm the uh, government affairs manager for Ed Staub and Sons Petroleum. And we are a major fuel distributor in Northern California. We have an extensive, uh, massive fleet of fuel trucks. Uh, we work at all the uh, major terminal facilities. Um, personally, I'm an expert in climate change. I've studied the entire climate change subject uh, for 25 years. And I also have, um, I'm not a lawyer. Um, I should have been a lawyer, uh, but I have been studying you know, different sections of law for many, many years, uh, labor law and its particular energy. Um, I'm I'm concerned with uh, the high costs of fuel in California and the lack of the public knowledge as to the reasons why. It's not the refiners, it's not the fuel distributors. Um, so that's a big issue with me. And um, I've also followed the implementation of, uh, you know, the climate uh, programs in the various states uh, for the last 20 years uh, from the very beginning. So I'm well-versed on that. Um, and I'm also well-versed on you know, the EPA regulations and the waiver that California kind of erroneously has. Um, so I'm really focused on, on that. Um, but the main thing is that I wanna see liquid fuels remaining part of the energy portfolio uh, not only in the United States, but in California particularly. Um, we are taking the view and the stance that, you know, electric trucks are great, but um, we can't, it's not the, you know, government's job to regulate uh, fuel out of business. And the consumer, you know, in our capitalist society, the consumer is really the ultimate deciding uh, factor as to, you know, if they want that. And I feel that, um, you know, I could bring a lot to this group and I'm, I'm really honored to be here. And um, I, I come from a democracy stance as well. So uh, I'm just here representing the, the fuel industry and, and other fuel distributors in California. And uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, implementing and helping you implement this in a fair, uh, equitable manner for every party involved. Okay, thank you. Um, Ervin? Yeah, thank you. First off, uh, I wanted to thank uh, ARB staff, you, Leslie, and, and all the others for uh, organizing this and for inviting me to be a part of this uh, panel, this timely and important panel. Um, I am Arvind Kailas, uh, and good to be among familiar faces, I should say. i uh, worked with a lot of you in the past. I am the Advanced Technology Policy Director for Volvo Group North America, and I work on state and federal advanced technology uh, topics. And within the transportation electrification space, uh, during the better part of the last two years, I've been working hard with the industry and a lot of you on this call uh, to really come up with uh, ZEV Im implementable ZEV infrastructure solutions so that we can really realize the affordable uh, clean energy transition in California and across the U.S. A little bit about the Volvo Group. Uh, we are a global company. Uh, we are... Uh, playing in the transportation and infrastructure solution space. And we make uh, medium duty and heavy duty trucks, transit and coach buses, construction equipment, different types of construction equipment, power solutions for marine and industrial applications. And we finance and provide services uh, for increasing our cu customers uptime. Specifically in North America, we are playing big, going big when it comes to transportation electrification or electromobility, as we call it. So we have uh, you know, five configurations of the Volvo VNR electric. We have the Mac uh, LR electric. We have the Mac medium duty. Uh, that's uh, within the last two months we made that announcement. We have five different versions of the Volvo construction equipment, the battery electric versions, and actually working on a couple more as we speak. There's the Nova bus, uh, LFSE plus electric bus. So there's a lot going on uh, in the different sectors as, as it concerns, you know, moving goods or moving people or helping build things. So we definitely have a keen stake in in, in the ZEF space. Uh, uh, that's that's the main reason I'm here. And, and you know, a lot of good things have been said by my co-panelists. And so I'll echo that. And I'll just politely underscore that the timely provision of power, I think, becomes very, very critical. And I think, uh, Mal, you pointed out the misalignment. I think that is definitely hitting us hard. And within the timely provision of power, 
it really has permitting, it really has energization, it really has grid readiness, so all of the above. And I'll also, again, put a plug for the cost side of things. As things get delayed, the, the cost of equipment actually goes up. And this is not just the chargers, but also the construction costs. And I know from the utility side, they are also facing challenges in terms of you know shoring up the, the necessary equipment for the distribution side of things. So once again, thank you. And I look forward to working with all of you uh, to come up with solutions uh, to to advance this area. Thanks. Thank you, Aravin. Um, Kevin Hamilton. Uh, you got me there. So um, my name is Kevin Hamilton and my camera doesn't seem to want to come on at all right now. Sorry. Let's try again. There we go. And I am the executive director and senior uh, government policy director for Central California Asthma Collaborative. We work across the San Joaquin and the state of California on energy infrastructure and the distribution of electric vehicles um, in mainly disadvantaged communities on um, both sides of the Sierras now at this point and, and all the way down to the Mexican border with our partners there. Um, you know, it's been interesting. I, I want to, I don't want to repeat everything. So I, I give a plus plus, as we say in this world now, to everything that's been said about concerns. I will comment that we're all very aware that there are special needs vehicles out there with special duty cycles, and we have to consider those. And uh, I would like to think that on the committees I sit on at CARB and at CEC that we are making those concerns now at CTC that we are uh, considering those and, and giving those the latitude they need in order to uh, successfully make uh, whatever conversion we can get to that works for them as well. Obviously, we don't want to see emergency vehicles stuck out there, uh, unable to perform their uh, various duties. Um, and so going back to the mainstream trucking industry, uh, what we've seen is just what we've heard already is this sort of uh, disconnect that was one of my uh, fellows uh, mentioned earlier uh, and colleagues that we see work going on in various places that's run by other agencies, some outside of California, the federal government, some uh, through DOE and some run through agencies in California and not a lot of connection between the two. And we hope that this group can be uh, the glue that brings that together, because certainly the majority of those players are here at this table, which is a wonderful thing to see. And that's how we get things done. Examples of this include solar fields going up that are independently powering uh, uh, truck uh, infrastructure down in Bakersfield at Wadi V uh, with new models of uh, Class A truck distribution and, and loads. So uh, it's spreading across the state now into the northern uh, states here, all the way up to the Canadian border. So there's, I think we look a lot of things that aren't working, but I haven't heard a lot of discussion about what is. And I'm hoping we can see a little bit more of that as we move on. I think we're all quite aware of the barriers that the grid presents or and its weaknesses. Uh, I think CEC has made that very, very clear in numerous reports, most recently just last year. Uh, sitting on the ZEV Clean Transportation Funding Advisory Committee, we are working hard to make sure that the governor and others are keeping their promises as far as uh, funding budgets appropriately to make this transition happen. We are most concerned about the communities that we live and work in here in the San Joaquin in the Eastern Sierra, up north and down south in the deserts, where we have lots of residents who are part of this business in one way or another, whether they work in packing house and refrigeration houses or whether they're in trucks, driving them, moving produce and other products from here to the ports, that they have access to these same technologies as well. And that this transition isn't just focused at those large companies uh, that have 20, 100, 1,000 trucks spread across the country. Obviously, we need that, but we're seeing those transitions. There's not a week goes by that another big trucking company doesn't announce significant purchases and investments in the, into electric vehicles. <clears throat> this whole conversation reminds me of, this will date me well, uh, of being in the hydrogen or the uh, natural gas conversation back in, in the late 90s and early aughts. Uh, it's like a replay in many ways of, uh, of many of the concerns, and all those were legitimate then, and these are now. But as then, we found solutions for those. I'm confident we will now. 
So I'm grateful to be here in this uh, great August group. Uh, uh, and I believe this group has definitely got the members who can do something about this. So uh, I'm looking forward to the work. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kevin. Kevin, we're, we're, I think we only have five more in the queue. So if you guys can, um, you know, keep, keep two or three minutes or less, we appreciate it. I'm going to pass it over to Serge Ferrison from Mainspring Energy. Thanks so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great, thank you. Hi, and, and thanks to the CARB staff for convening this working group uh, and for inviting me to participate. I'm Serge Berylson with Mainspring Energy. We're a Menlo Park, uh, California headquartered technology provider. Um, you know, just some quick background. We've developed a new form of on-site non-combustion power generation, the linear generator, that is fuel flexible and dispatchable. So what that means is we can dynamically switch between any gaseous fuel, including hydrogen, ammonia, biogas, renewable natural gas, natural gas and even propane with no hardware changes uh, to generate electricity. This 230 kilowatt unit fits in a standard shipping container and can be easily sited wherever power is needed for a range of applications on both sides of the meter, notably including rapidly adding local capacity to charge electric vehicles, uh, as well as for utilities to add capacity on the grid side. Um, the nice thing about being this late in the order is a lot of the really good points have already been covered, so I can uh, get through this pretty quickly, but I'll just reiterate that, uh, uh, you know, pile on the, the comments of a number of folks around the central hurdle of the need to rapidly add capacity to energize uh, medium and heavy duty EV charging. Um, we, we've, we've heard about supply challenges, we've heard about timelines, um, I won't repeat that, but obviously the, the necessary upgrades take time. Um, and clean on-site generation can rapidly add, add capacity, energize vehicles. And also one other piece that I haven't heard too much about is uh, resilience during grid outages. You know, grid outages um, from, from you know, volatile weather conditions are growing more frequent and more volatile. And if we're going to electrify a huge amount of vehicles, we need to ensure that they're able to provide, you know, the incredibly necessary services even during uh, grid outages. So um, just wanted to add add that piece of, of clean resilience. So with that, I'll, I'll conclude and and thank you again to CARB. Thank you. Um, Zachary Artusquay. <laughs> yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes. You can please say your name. <laughs> yeah. My name is Zachary Artosky, and uh, I'm the Regional Environmental Coordinator for Knife River Construction here in California. And um, we're a multifaceted uh, construction slash mining company, deal with a lot of aggregates, asphalt, uh, ready mix, concrete, transportation, and uh, construction. So I'll try to keep this quick because uh, I, I know Reed Carter actually touched on a lot of things that we're having a hard time with um, in regards to understanding how the new infrastructure is redefining uh, our business model in a sense and kind of changing how we do things. And some of the things that uh, we have been facing that I haven't heard mentioned uh, and is somewhat unique to us, but I'm sure others are uh, facing is infrastructure for vehicles that actually go home with uh, our workers at the end of the day. So at the end of their duty cycle for the day, let's say a foreman would take his vehicle home with him and then setting up infrastructure for an electric vehicle in that setting where we can then discern between their power usage and what we're requiring for the vehicle for work. And then another issue that we uh, have been coming across is a large, a very large portion of our vehicles and our fleet are uh, in a class that doesn't have uh, any configuration available for uh, its intended duty. And it's hard there, or Going from that, it's hard to predict and kind of build an infrastructure plan that will suit uh, our needs and be able to be modular enough to accommodate the growth of our company. So I'll just go ahead and keep it short at that. And that's what I got. Thank you so much, um, Jimmy, Andrea. Andrea Lee. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Jimmy Andrioli with Baker Commodities. Um, I am the Vice President of Public Relations Legislative Affairs. We're a three-generation family-owned and operated company and have been here in uh, California since 1937. Um, we're a high-priority fleet here with about 130 trucks in California. We service the agricultural and hospitality industries, providing recycling services of byproducts like used cooking oil, grease trap waste and wastewater, fat and bone, and animal mortalities. Uh, we are a carbon negative company and we sequester more carbon than we produce. And we're very proud of the contributions to environmental sustainability that we've done. Uh, we do utilize light, medium, and heavy-duty trucks, um, including tankers, van trucks, and specialty trucks that utilize PTOs to operate pumps um, and mechanical operating mechanisms on our vehicles. Um, Echoing all of the uh, concerns we've heard so far, I think one of the things that hasn't been mentioned yet is that we do actually have trucks that come in from other states like Arizona, Nevada, and Oregon, which do service some of the border regions of California. And as far as our interpretation of the rule, they would be uh, included under the California fleet that we operate. Um, as such, we have you know concerns about the infrastructure in the neighboring states as well. Um, you know, being that these vehicles are you know homed in another state, operate shortly in California in return. We just don't have the infrastructure in those other states to, uh, to support the you know charging or refueling of those vehicles. Um, and the second one for us really is kind of the availability of trucks. Um, today, we're still struggling to find um, trucks that meet the demands of our dynamic fleet, you know, the distance, the amount of power required for PTO operation, et cetera, um, you know, to not have to change up the entirety of our operation, how we do business um, and keep us sustainable as a company at a price point that makes sense. So looking forward to working with you all um, and thanks for having me. Thank you so much. Um, Tamina Chowherty. Thank you, Leslie. Uh, my internet connection is saying is unstable, so I think I'm going to stay off uh, video. That's okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Tamina Chowherty. I serve as California State Policy Manager at Blue Green Alliance, also known as BGA. Uh, BJ is a coalition of labor unions and environmental organizations working together to address today's environmental challenges in ways that create and maintain quality jobs and build a clean, thriving, and equitable economy. Our goal is to promote clean jobs and clean infrastructure that benefit workers, consumers, and the environment. Uh, one of our key focuses uh, is to support the transition to zero emission trucks and buses, uh, which can reduce, we believe, greenhouse, uh, we, can, it's, we believe um, air pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and fuel cost, while creating quality jobs in manufacturing, installation, and maintenance. We believe that rebuilding America's infrastructure in a clean, resilient, and equitable way uh, can help address the challenges of climate change, economic inequality, and public health. Some of the challenges uh, facing zero emission truck deployments in California include the lack of sufficient charging infrastructure for battery-powered trucks, uh, some of you already mentioned that, uh, which can limit the range and availability of zero emission trucks. Uh, we believe there is a need for more community engagement and education on the benefits and the opportunities of ZEV transportation, uh, such as low, lower fuel and maintenance costs, reduced greenhouse gas emissions, and improved air quality and public health. Um, and finally, uh, we believe there is a need for fair labor standards and protection for workers in the zero emission truck industry, such as um, making sure that they have living wages, benefits, health and safety uh, standards and collective bargaining rights. Also expanding uh, those standards and protection to workers when building out the ZEV charging infrastructure. Thank you, I'll pass it back to you, Leslie. Oh, thank you, Tamina. Um, Matthew Zurega. Ah, uh, not the last one. Um, so I'm, the, I'm Matt Zurega, Director of Fleet Consulting for a company called Terra Verde Energy. We're out of San Francisco, and uh, we're an independent energy advisory services and uh, asset management firm with about $500 million of solar and battery projects on the ground um, that we help design, deploy, and operate. I, I joined Terra Verde to develop and deliver ZEV transition and compliance planning services around ACF primarily. 
um, which is a domain I've been dedicated to since about 2009. Uh, formerly as with Semper Energy Corporate Development as a manager, manager of economic analysis and policy. I did a great uh, deal of work around the financial math and technical math from hydrogen production to PV to stationary batteries to EVs. Uh, then I was with sdg and &E, the uh, utility down in San Diego, where I designed the employee charging system that's still deployed across the properties down there and, and in operation. Uh, I wrote some of the early stage testimony around the Power Your Drive program, uh, helped bid the EV charging system into the CalISO market. So this all this EV and EV infrastructure stuff is something I've been focused on for a very long time. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, challenges brought up by a lot of other people on this call that are uh, quite uh, pertinent and important. Um, and uh, I, I've seen those in real life. A lot of these challenges uh, are not new. Uh, a lot of people have experienced these. I saw some of these when I was with Shell New Energies, when they came here to the United States to establish themselves in EV charging infrastructure. Um, also with a EV charging infrastructure firm, I don't have any affiliation with any of these companies that I've mentioned anymore, only with Terra Verde. And uh, some of the other challenges I think that are, are, are key are the primarily the definition of, of available around ZEVs. Uh, you know, if, if our friends from Volvo say that something's available, we can have a certain level of confidence. If, if a company that is pre-profit and been in business for 10 years or less says that something's available, um, it's not the same as when Volvo says it, uh, just for example. Um, and I, I mentioned that because there, there does not appear to be criteria applied that takes these kinds of uh, considerations uh, in, into effect. And another concern I also see is that there doesn't appear to be any distinction made between things like hydrogen fuel and electric fuel. And, and why this matters is because if, if, if a fleet dedicates themselves to electric, for example, and then the only avail vehicle available for a particular function is hydrogen, then as it appears uh, through the regulation as it's written today, a fleet may find themselves having to buy $3 million worth of hydrogen fueling equipment, even though they've already made a commitment to electric. And mm -hmm. this could be this could be challenging. All right, then uh, one more speaker, and that would be Damon Wyckoff, Calaveras County. Yeah. Thank you, Leslie. Appreciate it. Uh, yep, Damon Wyckoff, Director of Operations for the Calaveras County Water District. Um, CCWD is a special district. We provide water and wastewater services to rural communities, uh, many of which are disadvantaged throughout Calaveras County. We have six water systems and 13 wastewater systems that range in elevation from 500 feet to 6,000 feet. Uh, we make use of over 70 heavy-duty heavy duty vehicles, ranging from 4x4 four four service trucks to bucket trucks, vacons, gap vacs, etc. And we ask a lot of these vehicles. Uh, a lot of our system's infrastructure is located in remote terrain, miles apart from each other. And we need uh, to ensure that these vehicles are going to work when called upon in all uh, climates and all um, storms and uh, all of these systems are in a, a high wildfire hazard severity zones as well. So when we start to talk about uh, types of ZEVs, uh, that is definitely a consideration for uh, rural utilities. And I think I can speak for all water and wastewater uh, service providers uh, in that our responsibility for our community's public health and safety makes us risk averse. And therefore, our vehicles are key tools and we cannot implement a lesser deficient tool over our gas and diesel counterparts. Uh, therefore, the ZEVs need to operate just like those vehicles do now. Um, we need to ensure that we don't undermine the continuity of service uh, when it comes to providing safe and reliable water and wastewater services. Um, so I, I think challenges are working to implement the Clean Fleets Rule economically without compromising public health and safety. Uh, I think that one really hasn't been touched upon yet, but it is critical to the water and wastewater service providers throughout the state, uh, as well as our, our as are the other the other um, key items of consideration everybody brought up. You know, vehicle availability, duty cycles, grid reliability, uh, service size relative to charging stations, uh, mechanical staff training, Class A license requirements and really emergency response as well during uh, extended power outages due to atmosphere, atmospheric river storms. So uh, looking forward to working with all of you. Uh, 
um, uh, it's good to be last. It's good to knock this out and uh, look forward to getting getting moving on the on the real work. Thank you. Okay, so just to be sure, did I leave anybody off? All right, hearing that, I want to move in to what our what our plan next. And actually, we're three minutes ahead of my little internal schedule here, so that's a good thing. Um, we're going to take a break, so I'm going to remove, I'm going to stop sharing the screen here, um, and we're going to take a break and uh, reconvene with, uh, let's say, Annalisa, what do you think we should do? Give it 15 minutes um, so we can develop that poll and then come back on, and we're going to do a live poll. Yeah, where realistically, I would like to say 10, but realistically, I'm, you know, we've got a good head start, but we've got to actually get it into. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so 15, like if we say 15, what's the math there? Five minutes to let's go with five minutes to three. That makes my life easier. So um, what we're going to do here is just everybody's going to be turning on this side, turning our camera and um, uh, mute, going into mute. Um, and then um, we will put ourselves back on the screen and start that poll. And for um, the rest of, you know, and to, to continue the meeting after the poll. Okay, uh, back at 2.55. Thanks. Hi folks. Let's see if we can bring folks back. Maybe we can do a quick show of hands if you're back. Raise your hand if you're here. We have 22 out of 35 panelists with their hands raised, letting me know that they're back. I will assume we're pretty close. Okay, well, thank you for giving us the um, time to put together a quick poll. Um, the way we're going to do this is um, Wente is going to share a poll within Zoom that will ask you to rank um, the top five issues that we heard today. There are some groupings that we've that we've um, we sort of meshed uh, issues together into um, because we have a limit within Zoom of ten uh, topics. And um, so I'm going to share a document. Uh, see if I can share my screen. Um, Let me know if that's, and if anybody has their hand raised that doesn't want to make a comment right away, feel free to um, lower it. Thank you for letting me know that you're back. Are you sharing a screen right now, Annalisa? I'm trying to. I'm getting. Oh, got it. Got it. I'm not having the greatest day with Zoom today. Um, let me see if I can try that again. Uh, I'm getting the error message that Zoom has quit. Um, okay, can folks see my screen? It's a little yep. small. Yes. Okay. And yeah, large and a little. The feedback that the text is really small. Yes. What we uh, uh, what we grouped were. Um, Things like grid issues. So heard from um, folks that they were concerned about interconnection time. Oh. You're freezing, Annalisa. Uh, 
Uh, she's frozen. I'll take over. <laughs> um, yeah, what we heard about. Yeah. Um, so we tried to categorize what we heard the best we could. So grid issues um, is going to the things like interconnection timelines, electric grid electrical capacity, power to um, power to operate there at very large scale, um, balancing the rates um, with and grid build out. Um, rate design for small fleets, um, that kind of thing. So we've lost the share screen, but those of you, you probably had an opportunity to look at that list and see how we group them. So um, I'm back. You, um, I just got through the first one. Okay. Is there anybody else who's in the document, um, like Miriam, who could try and share her screen? I just seem to be really unstable in Zoom today. I apologize for that. Sure, Annalisa, I'll try Thank to you. share my screen and the document with the team. Yes. And thank you for the um, comment from Audrey that uh, interconnection is not the same as um, energization. I will actually change that. Can anyone see my screen? Um, oh, yes. sure. Okay, let's be sure now. Okay, how about now? Yes. Here we go. Okay, let me zoom in a little bit so you can see it. Okay. So how is it now? Good. Good thank you. Do you want to continue, yeah. Elisa? Sure. So we had grid issues, um, cost concerns we heard come up quite a bit, uh, everything from infrastructure and construction costs um, to upstream grid upgrades, um, the cost of fuel um, rates, uh, which shows up in both grid issues and, um, and cost concerns, uh, the value of LCFS credits. Um, the pace and timeline of infrastructure deployment, this includes equipment availability, workforce to install and maintain. Um, and this is an interesting one because I could see having a whole trig um, conversation uh, or meeting dedicated to workforce um, issues. And then separately, there, there could be other issues that we want to tackle there. But um, let's see how that, uh, that how that comes out in the priorities. Um, a number of folks raised uh, um, interest in talking about hydrogen. Um, we have the right sizing of infrastructure for fleet needs, including planning for infrastructure needs for vehicles um, not yet on the market. Um, other groupings included permitting around timing, requests for additional work, um, and who requires permits. Uh, other groupings around non-depot-based infrastructure needs. This was one we made up on the fly. Um, the need for public infrastructure for fleets that don't have a regular uh, like return to base um, situation uh, or don't have regular routes. So their their infrastructure needs will vary um, as well as how that might apply uh, for um, rural uh, fleets, um, the scale of infrastructure needed, uh, leaseholders that are unable to install in their current, um, their current parking situation, um, and then serving trucks uh, that are coming across the border from other states, as well as serving um, home-based fleet vehicles. You might notice there are some things that didn't make the, um, the survey. Uh, we will not lose track of those and keep track, uh, but um, uh, we have a limit of 10. Um, and if the concerns that you raised weren't specific to infrastructure, they aren't on this list. But um, obviously we care uh, about those and we'll find other forums to talk about them. Um, so, Wente, would you like to administer the, um, the poll? Oh, and then um, choose five, your top five, right? Yes, you'll be asked to rank your top five. And I see Matthew's comment about um, recognizing uh, the availability of ZEVs from long established OEMs versus startups. Um, and that'll be definitely a topic to raise with the um, rule provisions trig. For some reason, it's not allowing me to click to vote here. Oh, yeah, me either. It says hosts and panelists cannot oh. vote. 
Oh. Ah. Oh, look at that. But but we are getting. Gotcha. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> Panelists can't vote. Shoot. Huh. Well, that was unexpected. Yes. <laughs> well, can we follow up with our panelists um, directly after the meeting with like uh, a Microsoft poll? Um, with, let's talk about, let's get the results from our um, our significant audience of attendees and um, see if we can uh, get some verbal uh, uh, sort of, does that sound right um, from our panelists? And then we'll follow up with a, with a panelist poll. So are we getting votes from our attendees? Looks like we are. Um, Wente, do you have a good feel for how many votes you're getting? I currently have 18, 19, 20 responses. It's still okay. kind of going up. Okay. This is, um, this isn't the kind of like, this isn't a yes, no question. So, um, we'll take, yeah. a minute. we'll take a few minutes here and let, let me know if anybody has questions about the topics. David Rothbard, just looking at the survey, I don't see the last item 11. Is that on the survey? We could only put in 10. Ah. Yeah. Uh, I definitely agree. Standardization of infrastructure is important, and um, we're not going to lose track of that for sure. Thank you. After we are, we do this exercise, we, um, we're hoping if we have the opportunity to start hashing out agenda for our first, second, third meetings, we could easily see that one falling into one of those um, meetings. Question regarding that. Um, is that related to the plugs for the EVs themselves? It could, there's the plug is just one piece of the whole, um, <laughs> the whole equation when it comes to charging. So the, just, yeah, when the gentleman raised it, uh, he was taught he used as an analog our cell phones and the various mm -hmm. uh, plug forms. And so I was thinking if that's what we're talking about, we need the EV manufacturers. Yeah. And Frank, I could I could highlight this specific problem was there's different standards for different apparatus. So for example, we installed conduit for something that would have a certain amperage, which was not adequate. So two inch conduit was not adequate for the higher charging facilities we need today as an example, but it's just everything needs to be standardized. That's just an example, including the plugs. Right. Thank you very much. And we have a question that um, workforce doesn't show up. It's grouped with pace and timeline of infrastructure deployment. Um, that one was a little tricky. Uh, like I mentioned, I think we could see workforce um, issues being a, a meeting all on its own. Uh, so, um, but we, for, for purposes of trying to get things down to as close to 10 as possible, um, we grouped it with uh, pace and timeline. A quick question is is the list for uh for the whole scope of the panel's work or is it just for the next meeting that we're trying to narrow down the list? I think we're looking at um establishing where we want to go for the next um two or three, maybe even four meetings. So um certainly for the next first we'll be identifying um what our priority is for the next meeting. Um and then uh will work with the remaining priority uh, topics for upcoming meetings. 
but it's definitely something that we'll likely um, uh, um, revisit at least annually to make sure you know something might have solved itself before we got to it, or something might need to be revisited uh, because we we just haven't got there yet. Right, and then we'll be we will be returning to this list primarily. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. How are we doing with um, response rate, Wente? We have 42% of participants who have okay. responded. Let's give folks um, two more minutes, if that's reasonable. It may be that not all of our participants want to um, yeah. participate, like to... but we'll give well, them two minutes. Give them 53. Well, that, that's pretty, if, it, if it's 42% of all participants when the panelists can't vote, then that's probably pretty close to, that's a much higher share of those who can't vote. Hey, Leslie, quick question is, are these um, questions going to be anonymous or are they attributed to who answered them? I think they're anonymous. And um, Ryan, also, we're planning on um, sending out a Google poll. I think we have our student put together a Google poll to send out to the um, panelists um, after this, right, Annalisa? Mm -hmm. So you guys have the opportunity to chime in. Yeah, it, it would be anonymous. I'd prefer that, uh, you know, obviously we're under NDA with a lot of. Uh, Given the scope of what we deal with, we're under NDA, and I wouldn't be able to answer questions of it as attributed to UPS because that could you, influence market trends. Mm, you know, right? It, it, that's so. That's pretty. Google poll has that, right? I think so. Okay, we'll make sure. Yeah. I appreciate it, Leslie. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's, okay, well, let's um, let's see what what came from our poll. And um, I'm not sure if we need to have the. Okay, so. Grid issues, cost concerns, pace and time of infrastructure deployment. I'm assuming that the lighter blue is rank one, followed by darker blue. If you scroll down, it gives you what the oh, colors okay. mean. But yes, you are correct. OK. So it looks like our top three topics are grid issues, cost concerns, and pace and time of infrastructure deployment. Um, not with if you looked at top three. Um, it looks like permitting falls pretty high too. Um, okay, any any comments from our panelists on these results? Does this surprise you? Little surprised emergency operations isn't a little bit higher. Yeah, okay. Quickly, the very same thing, but I, I'm sort of attributing that to the number of folks who are on the Zoom call who don't, you know, don't have to operate in their such circumstances. Right. Yeah. 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 We might have a disproportionate um, percentage of people who are part of the panel who didn't get to vote just now, um, right. who have that concern compared to the attendee audience. Right. Right. So we'll get that squared up with our follow up survey. Okay. Any other thoughts? Chris? Yeah, just, yeah, just one um, kind of thought on, I, I saw non-depot-based infrastructure needs came in basically last. Um, and for those that, um, you know, maybe don't have to think about uh, the folks who either cannot or, you know, just aren't in a position to do depot based charging. I think most people that know at least the battery electric technology 
are naturally going to say that, well, why why would you deploy these vehicles if you don't have a depot um, or a home base to charge them? Um, but the reality is the um, the rule. I think I can at least you know say this about the regulation. It it does require uh, fleet operators that um, may not be in a position to do depot based charging to deploy zero emission vehicles nonetheless. And so this has been one of the things that I've, I, I think had the biggest trouble with is trying to figure out what a feasible, you know, economical model for random access retail um, style charging facilities look like in the commercial vehicle space. Um, and maybe people said it's not important because you can't figure out that problem. It's not, something that's solvable, but um, just just putting it out there that that is actually one of the big unanswered questions because unfortunately the rule provisions don't include either delays or extensions for, um, you know, let's say you are in the drayage portion of the regulation, you bring your truck home at night and you're probably not gonna call up Southern California Edison and ask them to drop in a you know, 150 to 350 kilowatt charger at your residence. So that mm -hmm. necessitates some other solution. I know that Adam probably has some, you know, opinions about um, maybe truck as a service or charging as a service in that scenario. But um, just just putting it out there that I'm, I'm a little surprised to see it rank so low because I think that is one of our biggest problems. You know, everyone knows depot charging and the problems associated with that, but that is something completely out of the hands of the fleet operator. The lack of a you know third party retail charge it's not necessarily ranked we said top we gave you 10 choices and so this was just number five <laughs> so yeah. i absolutely agree with you chris <laughs> yeah chris it's 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 not an issue very much for my members although i am aware that some of my very small members uh their drivers uh, periodically will bring the trucks home with them but i don't know that it's a norm for my in my world but I agree with you. I think it's a, a significant challenge for Drage. Uh, and, and Chris, I didn't get a vote, unfortunately. Uh, all the panelists weren't uh, weren't allowed to vote on it. So, um, so I would have voted it higher. You're uh, you you are absolutely right. I I do think it is a challenge. We'll follow up for sure. Yeah. This is David Rothbart. Real quick question: As far as it's kind of hard to decide as far as a group. What's most important based on just three minute discussion? Yeah. My point would be, is this something it can evolve depending on future discussions? Absolutely. Yes. Great. Yes. I, um, I mean, part of the reason that we didn't walk into this meeting with a set agenda of we're going to talk about permitting is because we don't we want to be responsive to this this group and um, the agendas uh, for our future meetings will be set through a combination of working with this group and with the co-chairs um, to figure out how to make them um, really responsive to what we need to be talking about uh, on you know, our scheduled meeting uh, dates and, um, uh, and, and make sure that we're able to pull together the right folks to have a useful and constructive um, conversation. Thank you. Okay, so what do we have next on our agenda, Leslie? Um, we have something comment. Okay, so that was um, over to, we're uh, like ahead of schedule here. We're seeking open comment three twenty five. So, um, if if there's any more discussion on this, what do you think? Are we I, good? Just, I have Should a quick comment, if yeah. I may. Mm -hmm. um, I just just want to reemphasize again that um, the regulation, as I read it, doesn't draw any distinction between electric fuel or hydrogen fuel okay. and that if a fleet you know is 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 progressing and adopting zevs and they've by by whatever for whatever reason have chosen either hydrogen or electric and they're partway down that road and they've invested in the infrastructure that they could find themselves in a position where the only available truck is from the other kind of fuel category in which case they'll then be sort of forced to uh, make make the financial commitment to a whole set of infrastructure that maybe they weren't planning in the beginning. And this that could be problematic. I just want to make sure we don't miss that. 
Sure. It's not something we're seeing, but it's um we'll we'll take that to heart. Can I can I riff off that a little bit, Matt? So what you what kind of when you think about that in terms of um the the grid overall and charging stations. So the challenge for the rural utilities when we're you know countywide is how do we deploy effective charging infrastructure for vehicles that we're not quite sure uh, how they're going to need to be charged, especially from a, a routine response or a, or, or a kind of an emergency response perspective. So that's created some difficulty on the water and wastewater side of, of you know, not, not only is it hydrogen and electric, but it's also, you know, okay, it's electric. Well, how do you do effectively deploy charging stations at remote, you know, warehouses or yards or, you know, service areas and still be able to get that vehicle back to where you need it to be, say, at the end of the day. Or, you know, that's another one that's challenging. So I, I wanted to um, respond to that as well. I think about this with a soccer metaphor, more shots on goal is always better. And um, I have members that are developing hydrogen charging stations. I mean, my I have electric members, NCPA and and. Uh, so some members in the northern part of the state are developing a hydrogen fueling station over in Lodi. I have Southern California members doing the same the same thing, and obviously they all are developing uh, electric charging facilities um, and serving electric charging needs. I, I guess is a better way of saying it. And so it is a little bit ticklish because we just you know, these these fleet operators don't know which way is going to develop where they needed to develop but from the perspective of the california pous we are looking at both so how about we do open up for public comment yeah molly you want to help launch that hi yes um I guess we'll just open it up for public comments. So if everyone can hear me, um, I have 121 attendees uh, listed here as um, as participating. And thank you very much for your interest. I have three folks um, right now with their hands up and I will call on them in order of the hands being raised. Um, so if you do wanna participate in this conversation, um, just raise your hand. And the first person I have with their hands raised um, is Hi, Seng, and if you can please state your affiliation, that'd be great. I've unmuted your mic. So I have um, Tai Seng, um, I've um, uh, unmuted your mic. You can unmute your yours from your end and uh, state your comment. Or maybe they had their hands up for a while. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna move on. Um, all right, the next person I have in line um, to speak is Cesar Santos. Um, Cesar, can you please state your affiliation and your comment? Uh, are we, now I'm concerned that this isn't working. Cesar? We can't hear you. It's showing he's muted. Is it possible? Uh, can you mute unmute from your end, Caesar? He's muted on his end. Yeah, I can't unmute his mic for him. All right. Um, Let's try the next one. I'm gonna skip down to John Constantino, because I, I know he's done this before. Um, John, I'm going to unmute your mic. You may sit your comment. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. So it did pop up on, on the screen to unmute. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, my, my first comment is to the question about, do you get to choose your, your technology path, whether you want hydrogen or not? That question has been ans asked and answered by CARB? And the answer is no. Um, if if there is an available ZEV, whether it's hydrogen or or battery electric, that must be purchased because you will not get an exemption. So uh, just to answer that question, uh, those of us in the in the trenches have asked before. So 
Um, and then the one issue that I I wanted to bring up is the issue of multiple sites and infrastructure delay exemption, trying to figure out how to go about getting that or planning for multiple sites if you're in multiple utilities. Um, that's an issue that uh, it's, it's, it's tough for the utilities if they're getting lots of requests uh, when really somebody only needs to, to electrify one site to meet their minimum standard, uh, but they have to go and ask multiple utilities uh, who can help them. So I just wanna add that to the list. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, so uh, does anyone wanna respond on the infrastructure team to John or to just go down the list? We're just keeping track, we're taking notes. <laughs> okay. Um, Next on the line, um, on the line to speak is Danielle Gallegos. Danielle, I've unmuted my your mic. You may is, and Danielle, I'm showing your mic as muted from my end. I don't know. Maybe maybe some of the, them had their hands up for a while. I I just noticed um the panelist list but i'm seeing some new folks putting their hands up so danielle i'm gonna remove permission to speak and i'll go to matt zernick matt um i've unmuted your mic you should be allowed to talk all right good afternoon uh, this is matt zernick so i'm a, a principal engineer at thermal king uh, transport refrigeration and welcome uh, this opportunity just to give a quick couple comments and mostly based on uh, just some under, kind of under underserved uh, or under-noticed uh, uh, situations for transport refrigeration within the infrastructure planning cycle. Um, we're, you know, a small portion of the commercial segment, but everybody wants frozen food and, um, you know, wants, wants, wants their food to show up in, in a good temperature controlled condition. So, um, you know, we've been we've been part of the the transition here for low emissions technology on the engine driven side for over ten years, and um, you know worked with Carb on that, and we've also provided infrastructure plug in solutions for our equipment since the '50s, which you know have have not had had large adoption for many of the reasons that we're stating here today for electrification. So, um, you know, we're looking for uh, we're looking for you know, similar solutions within the battery charging side, whether it be for straight trucks under some of the new um, the new requirements coming up here for 2024, or uh, within the trailer space that we're um, we're looking at uh, both for uh, on road trailer uh, for marine container for drainage operations, and basically make sure that there are plugs provided, uh, whether they be CCS. Um, whether there be more shore power options adopted, although of course we can't use those for battery charging, or for other solutions that will adapt existing uh, AC shore power architecture to battery charging solutions such as SAE uh, J3068 for three-phase EVSE. So just kind of want to plant some of those seeds. I'm available for connections and uh, look forward to participating uh, further on this. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Um, next in line to speak and the last person with their hands up is Richard Tebay. Richard, um, I have unmuted your mic and you may give your comment. Hi, thank you for the workshop. Um, I, I presume you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so the one, the one issue that hasn't been raised that I think will become an issue further down the line. They talked about standardizing the connection, the connectors, but what's really going to matter to a fleet is the reliability of the equipment and how quickly they roll a truck. So if, if there's a problem with a unit or a site, is that the site's responsibility? Is, is that going to be the vendor's responsibility? And how quickly do they get that up and running? And I think that needs to be factored in as well. I think there's a category that we can put that in, but I absolutely agree with you, Rit. Oh, 
Okay, well that, um, if anyone else who is participating remotely as an attendee and hasn't had a chance to um, provide comment, um, we'll give you about, you know, a few more minutes until we wrap up. And we have a raised hand, uh, Reed, if you have a comment. I just had a question, but if it's just attendees, that's fine. Oh no, I, I guess it doesn't matter anymore. We, I'll, I'll, I'll call on attendees if any more raise their hand, but there's none right now. Okay. Um, yeah, I just have a question kind of for the utility folks in the room, because I don't often have a chance to ask you guys questions. Um, I'm curious, you know, given that the grid capacity concerns were so highly ranked, um, and I've kind of, you know, we get asked about this and I have to provide an uninformed opinion, um, or just say, I don't know, but I'm curious what, um, what you folks see as the characterization of this challenge. So what I mean by that is, is the grid capacity concern one that it's a simple addition problem? So we just have to add more capacity and we know how we're going to do it and it's going to happen. We just need to give it time. Or is there some fundamental change that needs to occur for us to be able to meet this demand? If it's okay, I'd like to comment on that very quickly. Um, just from my membership perspective, we don't have a lot of information about the capacity charging needs of, of the vehicles. Uh, one thing I didn't mention in my introductory comments is that my membership is highly diverse. I have LADWP, it's the largest until uh, Muni in the country. And then I have uh, many members who have fewer customers than LADWP has employees, to give you an idea of that diversity. And, and so, uh, as such, the uh, capacity of some of these vehicles, uh, for example, the large capacity Tesla truck would be more than 50% of the existing uh, service capacity of some of my members. And so it really does vary quite a bit. Um, and, and so I, I think that just the diverse, and, and while my membership is diverse, and I don't want to speak for the IOUs, but it really gets to the uh, distribution nodes because some of the distribution nodes just don't serve heavy duty capacity you know, huge capacity, even for the uh, IOUs. And so it's really uh, where you're uh, where you're looking. And I see the note there, and I'm sorry, uh, Frank Harris with CMUA. Yeah, um, I would like to see, just to uh, go off on that um, topic. I think it's a super important one. And I want to echo what Audrey Newman had said in hers. Number one challenge was understanding where, when, and how electric vehicles will appear. And so that's a that's a real important subject matter for determining what that law that need, how that need is going to scale up, especially on a, a where and when category. And that's something that we've been working on internally um, with like how can we, how can we, how can we collaborate with our state agency partners, but also with our utility partners on data sharing to basically get a better understanding of that. And um, and I love the topic. So it's um, it, I'm wondering if maybe we can skip over to Eric uh, before we chat with uh, Matthew to kind of continue to pursue that line of thinking. Yep, and I, I can be brief here. And I suspect, you know, as the one IOU participant on this, on this panel, appropriate to, to provide some perspective, but judging by that poll, I think we're gonna have some time in subsequent meetings to, to dive more deeply into this topic because it is indeed multifaceted and, and nuanced. And the situation for each utility can be very different utility to utility, even if you know we're talking about IOUs as a group or POUs as a group. Um, there's just different challenges at each face. Um, for pg e for example, we have extreme you know, cost pressures and infrastructure build out that's needed to be done with respect to grid hardening, wildfire mitigation, other safety related uh, investments that are very needful. Um, and, you know, having those investments be able to be made and at the same time have, you know, near term 
uh, rate impacts be considered appropriately. There, there's just you know multiple uh, needs kind of pulling at the same same resources. Um, there's also a, you know a big a big theme here that Alex has spoken to is just the forward planning um, and and the kind of the, the regulatory construct with respect to um, how we re recoup our investments. Um, you know historically we've we've been required to use a certain a certain forecast for EV planning that um, wasn't aligned with reality. Um, that's being worked out um, going forward, but um, you know our, our hands historically have been tied with respect to how much money we can request for um, building out the grid due to that specific issue that we're working forward. So you know Audrey spoke to this as well earlier. Um, indeed, understanding when, where, and how the load's going to show up, and um, you know being able to pull forward those investments, but also doing it with, you know, cost pressures and um, that in the back of everyone's mind. Also just making sure, I mean, no, no one mentioned it here today, but you know, one reason, you know, PG&E and the utilities are focused so much on electrification is because it has this, you know, powerful ability to, in the, you know, longer run, put significant downward pressure on rates, right? Where all, all this grid build out is to enable more throughput through our system, which is a good thing for everyone even if they don't have or drive an EV. So, but making sure that's done efficiently and with, you know, cost um, concerns is, is, is at the top of our mind. Um, and yeah, indeed, this is a topic that we'll be excited to discuss more, more in, in future meetings. Thank you. Go ahead, Matt. So um, I, I'm not an IOU representative, but I used to work for one um, and, uh, and uh, did did some work at the GRC for the GRC in one year, and did a lot of work when I worked for the EV group uh, around all all of this. And I was a little confused too by the ranking of the infrastructure concerns, um, partly because from an IOU perspective, which is the majority of the state, right, is that there is a um, there's a rule called the obligation to serve, and so basically it says the IOUs can't say no. So if you need a megawatt connection. At the end of your distribution circuit, and you don't have one right now. The IOUs used to have to put it in. Um, so, that, so that and there's a huge financial incentive to do that, and it's called rate base. So any asset that the utility buys goes into the rate base, and the authorized rate of return is then earned on that rate base. So there's an incentive to put this infrastructure in, and it's strong. Um, so um, what? I think what the what the what the challenge is, at least in my mind, is in, with respect to this question, is that everything that I just described puts significant upward pressure on rates. Upward pressure on rates means that the fueling costs associated, in, whether it's hydrogen or electric, because hydrogen compression equipment requires electricity, um, bumps the the cost of the fuel for these vehicles up. So I'm sorry, this is kind of complicated, but but. I, I think it's important if we're if we're talking about um, infra or uh, um, infrastructure concerns. In, in my opinion, it's not electrical. It's not whether or not the capacity will be there. It will be there. The concern, in my opinion, is that it pushes the cost of the fuel up. So I just wanted to make that clear. I appreciate the balancing act that the utilities have to play. Um, Kyle. Hi, right, thanks. Um, I just wanted to continue this conversation a bit with some real world examples of what we've seen. Um, so we're, we're working, like I said, with a lot of schools across uh, New York state, and there are about six major utilities here and their grids are not all the same. They develop differently over time with different investment levels. So to give you an idea, there's some schools that we're working with where they have 240 vehicles and the batteries we're dealing with here are 210 kilowatt hour, 315 kilowatt hour. So really big batteries. And there's a school here where uh, National Grid, the utility said it's $30 million for you to get the five megawatt you need to power your 240 vehicle fleet. You have to build your own substation, man your own substation and get a railroad like through uh, real estate uh, through the town that you're in. That is a never going to happen thing. It's just, you're building a railroad through through a major uh, urban area. It's not gonna happen from a, from a distribution standpoint. And there's other schools down the road 
literally the next school district over that has 150 vehicles. So think about this in the same thing as trucks, where this could be your neighbor that's on the other side of the substation, where they say, you're fine. There's seven megawatt in the grid available for you. So what we're finding is that across the state, and I'm sure it's the same for California, that it's very localized what your problem actually is. Mm -hmm. So looking at, so the first thing we do, we talked about duty cycle a few minutes ago. We're looking at the duty cycle for every school that we can. We've done this for about a hundred schools right now. And we're trying to do it for the rest in the state. And once we do that, we're bringing that to the utility saying, this is how much power you need and when, so they could figure out what is a hard no and what's a maybe and what's a yes. And that's kind of what they're doing here to, to try and tackle this problem because it could just be no right off the bat. You, you can't, it's just a never going to happen thing. And that's something that we're very aware of here. So should we segue to the agenda setting or take one more comment? What do you think, Annalisa? Um, I see one other hand up. Let's let Ryan have yeah. the say here. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, I appreciate it. I, I agree with everything that was just said, except the part where it's localized, because it, it will no longer be localized when everybody's chasing the same electricity. It's going to just be a massive problem. And that's where I think the question asks, do we have to fundamentally change things? We, we do, unfortunately, and it's in a very tight window to create these fundamental changes, I think 10 years, right? Um, and when you start talking about the, you know, he spoke of like having to build out like a railroad type of infrastructure through a downtown area to meet this demand of scale, we're gonna see that everywhere. We're gonna see transmission lines going through communities that never had overhead power there before to support the electrification needs which is fine, that's what the state wants and, and, and we'll move that direction. Um, the, the problem is, is that I think if at scale it gets very complicated, that's where the fundamental problem happens at scale. But if there was a way that we could electrify where it made sense and, and all those communities and, and, you know, like I was said earlier, hang 10 chargers on a wall, maybe one DC fast charger and, you know, uh, 10 level two chargers, and we continue to scale, move through scale and phases versus trying to achieve this goal at, at, the, at the rate that we're required to, that fundamental change in 10 years is going to be very challenging and very expensive. So I'm I, trying to answer that question as best I can to say that the challenge is there with the fundamental change, and it gets extremely more difficult at scale, a little easier to solve at the smaller scale. But with the timeline pressures, we don't really have that option. I was going to let um, Annalisa kind of take the lead here, um, starting to build out that next, build out the agenda. Because um, we, one of the things we were really hoping to do at this meeting would, would be to decide what are we gonna talk about at our first real, you know, when we really kick this thing off um, our, at our infrastructure first, our next infrastructure trig meeting. Um, so um, Annalisa, are you, have, have you put some thought into this? I'm sure you have. Well, I'm kind of hearing a need to to talk about grid issues. You know, it, it ranked high from our attendees. Yeah. There was a little surprise from some of our panelists that it ranked so high. But even the conversation we're starting to go down right now indicates to me that it would be helpful for us to, um, as I think Adam put it, level set on on how the grid uh, is um, integrated into this larger question of deployment of infrastructure. Um, thoughts on that? Uh, are folks okay with us uh, having a focus on grid issues for our next meeting? Um, and do you have thoughts about how to make that a constructive conversation? Do we need to invite somebody? Um, would you like to have a presentation from CPUC? Uh, we only have, uh, I think, PG&E as the only IOU, but do we you know, reach out to the other IOUs and ask them to participate as well um, as panelists? Um, thoughts? Well, 
opening it up. Um, and Chris, you have your hand up. Yeah, and you know, it might be useful to have an overview of what's going on over at the CPUC FIT process, but just to do it one time. Um, mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't want this group to simply be, you know, FIT part two. Um, I, I think the problems or the challenges in the GRC and planning processes are very well identified um, by CPUC staff right now. And so I, I don't think there's necessarily a need to redo that here. Um, what I would encourage since we're, I think we're talking about focus and scope of this group is to really start thinking about the things that are within CARB's ability to um, actually affect, um, you know, some of the things that maybe are not being picked up by other agencies, um, you know, issues having to do with either, you know, charging standards. I mean, things as simple as we hear from our folks depending on which vendor you're working with, it could be, you know, a couple of weeks before your charger and your vehicle talk to each other, or it could be a couple of months, you know, those sort of things, just airing out the, the smoothing out of the process for fleets deploying the technology. Um, but just want to encourage that this does not become, you know, fit part two, because, there's already a very targeted focused discussion going on over at CPUC on some of these issues. And I, I think we, the problem statement is very well defined uh, over there. Yeah. We have talked in previous meetings about um, using these kinds of forums to talk more about how to gather data about the when and the where of truck tra um, transition. Um, so if that's something that that would help inform um, utilities, the CPUC uh, for grid planning purposes. Well, and, and I apologize just to follow up on that. Um, so th there is a fundamental issue with trying to do that right now. And I'll, I'll try to describe it as briefly as possible. So um, the Energy Commission has modeling, um, you know, the heavy load model will tell you a rough estimate based on the model of how many chargers at what speed by what year based on overall deployments. Now, the problem you have in moving from that modeling exercise, which is you know sort of top down to what I see the CPUC struggling with in the FIP and the sort of granularity that, uh, you know, like Cal ISO needs at the end of the day is modeling is one thing, but if you were to actually go out and talk to fleets um, outside of very specific duty cycles that are already well suited to the technology, you're going to get a lot of confusion and uncertainty about what the future looks like. You know, I think the uh, gentleman from Granite Rock sort of said it the best that e even for a company as sophisticated as them, they're completely rethinking their operations based on lack of a one-to-one -one replacement technology. And so any data you get is probably um, low, low confidence at best at this particular point in time because fleets are still themselves figuring out what they're going to do. And real world example, again, uh, a fleet may get a couple of years into, let's say a battery electric vehicle um, conversion and find out that the technology is not going to work and they're looking at, at switching. That's happened in transit, um, you know, as, as CARB staff knows. And so just a word of caution, you're going to be getting a lot of uh, very preliminary, probably low, you know, confidence type data um, from collecting it today. Thanks for that input. Um, Lisa? Hi, yeah, I wanted to comment on, I think one thing that the CPUC does bring to the table is SB 1000, which really provides a solution for making sure that rate design, which is very innovative today, specifically for medium heavy duty, is to be a benefit. But if the rate cases within those proceedings do not match the actual real world use cases, you end up with a, a, a bad result. And since these are proceedings, you can't undo what's being done by use cases that aren't well presented. And so there is a very innovative uh, uh, position that the 
rulemakings are doing right now from everything from ISO rates to real time rates, non time of use. Um, it's 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 enormous, and I think it's really impactful as a solution when you start understanding how these rate designs are meant to make sure that these medium heavy duty operators have a benefit. That's one aspect I want to make sure that I share. And as I listen to UPS and, and what's going on right now and some of this, how do we get there and trying to find this framework? Um, you know, one of the ways that we need to think about it, the big picture of it is we've got, you know, 10 and 15 years to get to scale. And I think in UPS saying, let's find a phased approach. I think if you think about 10%, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100% of the size of a fleet, whether that fleet is 10 and it's one or it's 100 and it's 10 for that 10%, the reality is that you've got this long lead time. And if we could just get started with that phase one, you will collect data. You will find out if you're doing 300 miles um, a day in a truck, and you're driving nine hours a day, you can only be doing 33 miles an hour in order to be driving the whole time. And so you find these windows that are solutions in the real world use cases. And when you put a 350 kilowatt charge into that, um, you know, you're know you gonna find solutions and we can't do it until everyone that's a fleet gets started with one truck or two trucks the grid will get there in 10 years or five years if we don't think about every solution being a scale. Um, I think that's the first way that we could start looking at the ZELF milestones or, um, or the model year and create a circle around what are these solutions for the small fleet, the medium fleet, because there really is, I think, a, a, a process that we could follow if we all understood how we could maybe get butts in the seat, so to speak, in these trucks. And each one of them had a week, a month. You really start opening up what is possible if the charging really does support these routes, or the or the speed is fast enough to support those routes because their dwell time organically is already happening. So that th that would be kind of a perspective I want to bring to the table to make sure we're not missing some of what's happening um, in terms of focusing on how we implement the ACF for all these fleets. Thanks. We've got just a few more minutes left. Um, next up, I have Raul and then Frank. Um, I'd like to touch on earlier when you mentioned about Prosivi, you know, why this subject's been touched on other matters. You know, I we do have people in our organization that can speak to that. So uh, if you were looking for someone that can speak from a utilities perspective on, on our end, I was going to, we can bring someone to that table awesome. to discuss that. Yeah. Um, I think okay. that would be really important so that people get to see because the things that are being discussed, the timelines that are being stated here and what's being um, assumed, um, I think it's just that, it's an assumption. So I think it'd be beneficial to the group and everybody on the stakeholders on this thing so they can have a better idea what it takes to bring an infrastructure into a facility and, and to the, the region, really. Okay, so. thank you. Appreciate that. Frank? Uh, Raul said something similar to what I want to say, but the one other thing I want to add to that is that there is an information problem, and Chris alluded to this. Um, the typical interconnection process, the customer goes to the utility and tells the utility what they need and where. And the utility says, okay, it gives them a timeline, and depending on what needs to be done, if there needs to be an upgrade to the local uh, station or what have you, uh, they give a cost. Um, these fleets don't know what they need right now. There's not a lot of information about these trucks. And I mean, I've gone to some of these manufacturers and told them who I am and what I'm trying to accomplish, and they can't give me that information. Um, I think that as we go on, and I apologize, the young lady from, I can't remember your name, so I apologize. I have a kind of trouble finding it here, but I think that once we start to see these trucks out there and there's more information about what the trucks need that process will become more efficient but when the truck the fleet owners the fleet operators don't have a lot of 
substantial information about what these trucks are going to require that makes it really difficult to talk in a direction. Thanks. Um, Aravind? Thank you so much. Yeah, I hope I'm coming through fine. Uh, as a suggestion to uh, another party that should be included, that could be included, I would like to throw out EPRI. And uh, this is because this will help level set things a little bit better. Maybe all of you are familiar with uh, sort of the latest uh, report that they put out, the EV to scale uh, 2030 results, but it sort of uh, distills down to the feeder level, you know, the aggregate load uh, with assumptions on, you know, based on telematics data from OEMs. And, you know, we definitely provided data uh, and it's, it's insightful. It's just good to know uh, what's at stake, you know, what, what might be needed uh, and, and maybe a good level setting activity uh, or as a part of the level setting activity. So I just wanted to uh, put that out there for consideration. And if folks are not familiar with the uh, EVs to scale 2030 uh, report that was published within the last two weeks, I can uh, send it to you, uh, uh, Leslie, Annalise, and Catherine, and you're, you're welcome to distribute it uh, to the other panelists. That'd be great. Um, do you have somebody in particular that you'd recommend including? Uh, I, I, I could sort of suggest Britta Gross. Uh, okay. That's one option. Or there's a couple people at EPRI who are, you know, very eloquent speakers and who have been very uh, close to this activity. Basically, it's, okay. it's their brainchild. So I'm, I'm happy to connect with you offline and, and okay. you know, okay. offer my and suggestions for your consideration. Yeah, if that's a report that we can include in our communications to the um, panelists, uh, I'd love to include that. Yep, it's coming your way very soon. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm I'm hearing some um, uh, interest in setting our next agenda to be focused on grid um, issues with um some discussion of you know kind of a an update from CPUC on the FIP, not a not intending to use this forum as a um, a way to continue that uh, proceeding, but but just to get level set um, on what's happening there, um, and uh, maybe some discussion of rate design, inclusion of um, additional um, uh, additional utility representatives, uh, and possibly a, a presentation also in a level setting um, fashion from EPRI on their EV at scale uh, work. Um, Can I screen share now for our closers? Yes. Okay. Take it away. I, I'll let you uh, continue, Annalisa. Okay. <laughs> well, we just talked about the agenda for the next meeting. Um, we've kind of talked about what action looks like. Um, you know, the, uh, we talked about uh, trying to find ways in which um, CARB and state agency partners um, may be able to take action as a result of feedback and conversation that we have in this group. Um, one example, just throw it out there, um, from the work group meetings that we had prior to adoption of ACF, um, there was interest from fleets in having access to a list of um, consultants that could help them figure out what it is they do need. Um, and uh, GoBus took that action item and created a website list of um, infrastructure consultants who are available. It's not a rating system. It's not a, uh, or it's not a um, endorsement from the state. It's just, these are professionals that offer that service. So that's an example of the kind of thing that can come out of this. Um, we had another example from CEC. I think Mark, you described that in your introduction. Um, so I really do believe that we can, through a uh, um, solutions-oriented approach to these conversations, uh, find ways to make uh, the conversation useful and um, uh, productive. And um, and so that's really what I'd like folks to come to our meetings with, is uh, thinking about first identifying what the problem is, but then really being willing to dig in and figure out what would it take to uh, to solve the problem. And that is, you know, it can be chipping away at something or it can be wholesale, like this would really, you know, move the earth kind of stuff. So um, 
that's where we will uh, follow up with a survey to the panelists um, on prioritizing uh, the topics that you'd like to discuss. Um, we'll include the uh, information about um, the uh, EPRI study. Um, we would like to use email and the use of surveys to communicate with you, with you and, and get your thoughts on stuff so we can keep things moving between our quarterly meetings. So um, please respond to those. Uh, let us know um, what you're thinking uh, as we're moving through this. I think um, we'll probably also use surveys to come up with a cadence or a schedule for those meetings so we make sure we can get um, the most participants. And then also with those surveys, I was thinking, Annalisa, if people have suggestions for people who would be like ideal yes, to speak on specific definitely. topics, we want, we want that as well. Yeah, for sure. Sounds good. All right. Oh my God, it's and, four o'clock. Yeah, and and Leslie is our point of contact um, for all things Trig infrastructure. Um, myself, Mark, and Adam, we're the the co chairs. If you've got any questions or want to carry on, uh, um, you know, and, and have conversation, uh, let us know. Um, I want to thank everybody for their time today and for committing to this process. Um, especially to uh, Adam and Mark for co-chairing with me and especially to our staff who have been um, diligently taking notes and scrambling to put together the survey and um, helping keep track of everything that's going on in Zoom land. Um, so thank you. And then if it's not me sending you that to email, it might be one of our students, but we'll just, just make sure we look out for that, okay? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody have a great rest of your day and have a great week and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Thank you all.